Uh, good afternoon, councillors. Can I just have a sound check? Can you hear me at the back? Yes, good. All right, welcome to this meeting of uh, the East Rally of Yorkshire Council's full council, and welcome to our many thousands of viewers on YouTube. On this occasion, I'd also like to welcome our newly elected member, Councillor Jane Phoenix, to her first meeting of the council. You want to give us a wave? Welcome to our rebels. Hope you enjoy them as much as I do. Please, uh, also, uh, with your consent, I would like to just say a very brief word uh, regarding the uh, retirement of Matthew Buckley. As you know, he's been our uh, head of legal for many years, always given us sage counsel and good advice. So I would formally like from the chair to thank him for his years of service and wish him a very happy retirement. Right on to uh, please ensure mobile phones are switched onto silent or off or preferably left in a bucket somewhere to avoid any disruption to the meeting. If the fire alarm sounds, you will be directed where to go. Please follow the instructions given by the officers. And can I please also take this opportunity to remind members of the protocol to be followed at this meeting and the procedures in place in relation to speaking. Uh, for those who are unsure of the protocol, I recommend you download it from the internet and keep it by your side as an aid memorandum. I would also like to ask members when speaking to be mindful of the forthcoming Beverly Rural Ward by-election to avoid breaching publicity restrictions during a pre-election period, otherwise known as PERDA. This meeting is not a platform for a campaign speech. I'd like to call upon the Reverend Tina Minette Stevens to lead us in prayers. Thank you very much indeed, Reverend. Move on to apologies. Alan, can you confirm any apologies for absence? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, we have apologies from councillors Beaumont, Beauville, Burton, Dennis, Fox, Healing, Holtby, Matheson, Sergeantson, Scow, Smith, Stathers and Sutton. 
anymore. Right, move on to item one, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? Right, I will now take nominations for the vice chairman of the council. Councillor Temple. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it is with mixed feelings that I propose Councillor Kay West for the role of vice chairman, a role she last held in 2010. Mixed because whilst I'm delighted that my friend Kay has not only been suggested, but is willing to repeat this role, it's tinged with sadness as we remember that it's owing to the death of the incumbent, Councillor Pauline Greenwood. In many ways, these ladies are alike, both really well dressed at all times, rooted in their communities, both married to farmers, and both involved in hospitality. Kay has been running a small bed and breakfast for over 30 years and has recently successfully branched out into glamping. But that's not all she was doing, she's been doing for a long way by a long way. As an active magistrate for 22 years, she volunteered her time for the Prison Me No Way program in schools across the region. The insight that the role gave her shaped her and her family, underpinning her willingness to help others. She'll be best remembered as one of the founding members of the Pocklington Arts Centre, only recently giving up this role. Other volunteering commitments include being district commissioner for the Scouts, despite, I am told, never having slept in a tent. Also presiding over the Market Wheaton WI and driving the Gadabout bus in and around Pocklington and the Worlds. Kay has also spent 20 years as a member of Pocklington Town Council and 15 years in this chamber, serving the residents of the East Riding. She served on many committees, was a review panel chairman, and more recently a member of the Fire Authority. She's a valued and long-serving chairman of the Ooze and Humber Drainage Board. Always willing to host, support or fundraise, I have no doubt Kay will be an excellent ambassador for the East Riding of Yorkshire Council and propose she is elected as vice chairman for the forthcoming year. Thank you. To second, Councillor Steele. Nation. Although I'm equally sad that this has come about due to the untimely death of Councillor Greenwood. Kay is a long-serving, dedicated councillor and an excellent choice for vice chair of this council. She has an impressive CV as ably presented by Councillor Temple, and I agree that she will be a great ambassador for the council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Steele. Are there any further nominations? In that case, we'll go straight to the vote. All in favour of Councillor Kay West, please show. All those against? Abstentions? Thank you. That is carried. And as she moves forward, I declare that Councillor West be duly elected Vice Chairman of the East Riding of Yorkshire Council for the remainder of the municipal year. And now we go for the chains. Been looking forward to this. We, we go back a number of years, don't we? Indeed we do. <laughs> Right, Declaration of Acceptance of Office. R.K. West, having been elected to the Office of Vice Chairman of East Riding of Yorkshire Council, I declare that I take that office upon myself and will duly and faithfully fulfil the duties of it according to the best of my judgment and ability. I might just uh, impale you in the process. Yeah. 
<laughs> I'll just say thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much. I will try and do my best again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll, and I'll enjoy the position as well. But uh, thank you very much for uh, having a bit of faith in me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kay. Uh, Councillor West, it has to be said that, uh, again, it is with a, a tinge of sadness because I do regret the passing of Pauline. I'm sure that Councillor West will do an excellent and diligent job. It means I'm no longer flying solo. Right, move on to item three, which is minutes. I move that the minutes of the meeting held on the 22nd of June, 2022, be approved and signed as a correct record. I'd like to second that, please. All those in favor, please show. Those against? Abstentions? Thank you very much, that is carried. Item four is petitions. There are no petitions. Item five, questions by electors. There are no questions. Item six, communications. There are no communications. Item seven, minutes of the cabinet and committees. I move that the minutes of the meetings listed at item seven on the council summons be received. And the recommendations contained therein be approved and adopted with the exception of minutes 119-22 and 126-22 of the Cabinet held on the 5th of July, 2022. Minute 23 and 22 of overview management, sorry, minute 23-22 of overview management of scrutiny committee held on the 9th of June, 2022 and minute 17 slash 22 of the Health and Wellbeing Board held on the 7th of July, 2022. I would like to second that, please. Thank you. All those in favour? Any against? Abstentions? Thank you, that is carried. Please note that as minute 126 slash 22, the Enterprise Zone property matter was an exempt item, the Council will be asked to consider excluding the press and public for consideration of this item, and this will be taken at the end of the meeting. Accepted minute, Councillor Owen to move and speak. Thank you, Chairman, and I'd like to uh, move that the accepted minute be received. Councillor Handley to second. I'd like to second. Councillor Oden. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I know we've got a very heavy agenda this afternoon, so I will be brief on these accepted minutes. And really, I just wanted to accept this minute, and there will be a little bit of a theme going through this afternoon, I'm sure, around cost of living and cost of living crises. Uh, so this is just the first reference very briefly to it. But first of all, we're talking about the financial outturn uh, for the Council for the last financial year. And I must start really by congratulating officers, particularly for achieving 98% of the savings that were in that budget that had to be made that year. That's over £10 million. And I'd like to uh, really thank officers for the hard work they've done to achieve this in incredibly difficult times over the past certainly two years. I'd also like to pay reference to uh, the capital programme where we've achieved 111 out of the 112 million pounds in the capital programme. Always bearing in mind that most of that money is spent locally with small businesses and enterprises. And again, I think a capital programme of that size will still be pretty rare along a lot of local government authorities in this country. We did have a 15 million pound so-called underspend and I think it's worth stating that really they were very much as stated in the report, one-offs. One was legacy money from COVID that we didn't have to use at the time that we had available. And also then, as it says in the report, due to sort of shortage of staff in certain areas, a carry forward of some of those, what would have been salaries. So although it's an underspend, it's probably not an underspend we would want because that money was budgeted to deliver services. 
So we've already put aside some of that money for the increased energy costs that we're anticipating, which are still our huge unknowns moving forward. But particularly, we've put aside 4.4 million pounds so we can target support during the year for issues arising from the current cost of living crisis. We thought that was prudent to do as a cabinet and also to put it into context, that 4.4 million pounds is roughly equivalent to about 2% of council tax. So that just puts in perspective uh, the size of, of the money that are there. That will be set aside for planned use, hopefully, when we see how things develop during the course of the year. So that was all I wish to say in terms of accepting that minute, but just congratulate officers for coming in on budget in very difficult times. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Does anybody else wish to make any comment? Or can I call upon Councillor Owen yet again to close the debate? Happily close that debate, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I will now take the vote. All those in favour, please show. <clears throat> Thank you. Those against? Abstentions? Thank you very much. That is carried. <laughs> Accepted minute overview management and scrutiny committee. Councillor Healy to move and speak. Received. Thank you, Councillor Healy. Councillor Meredith to second. Thank you, Chair. And uh, with your permission, I do have a few words to uh, to to uh, to inform the chamber why we would like to see this minute accepted. Councillor Meredith, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chairman. I'm happy to stand before you today and actually support Councillor Healy in the accepting of this minute. The council's policy relating to bullying is due to be updated. And both officers and councillors have put significant, excuse me, significant effort into ensuring that what is presented to cabinet is both robust and meaningful. I am pleased to say that I believe the new policy has been scrutinised extensively and that for the most part it has been found to be fit. As a result, I would like to commend it to cabinet and support its implementation. However, I am only able to do this if one point can be addressed, one point that has been raised repetitively and strongly by scrutiny. The internal procedures and information providing direction to external advice are more than adequate. These are two legs which ensure the policy can provide confidence and protection to staff and ensure that this is strong. But there should be a third leg, as anybody who's ever sat on a stool with any degree of certainty will know. And sadly, I do currently believe this to be absence. Internal independence is a phrase I find oxymoronic. You see, I do not believe it possible to depend upon an organisation for a paycheck whilst actively supporting somebody trying to raise a complaint about the very same organisation. Similarly, external advice and support, whilst essential, cannot be considered to adequately meet the need of, concerns, uh, of my concerns alone. As such, I ask that Cabinet strongly consider the benefit, of an the benefit that an independent person could bring. A voluntary role, akin to a co-optee, for example, as we see it safer and stronger or children and young people, where a capable and suitably qualified person could be available for advice and support. A role I believe would be essential in ensuring that this policy is not only strong, robust and fit for purpose, but one that we as councillors can have faith in, one that our staff can have faith in, and one that the public can have faith in, knowing that this council takes the well-being of its staff, the people here, to deliver services for that public very seriously. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Meredith. Apologies, Councillor Healy, I should have brought you in sooner. The reason we accept a minute uh, in this way is to draw the attention of, of the Council to discussions of importance which have occurred. And there have been discussions taking place at Overview Management Committee which commenced at this meeting that's minuted here on the 9th of June, when the committee was discussing an update on the corporate peer challenge and continued actually at the next meeting on the 14th of July, which I chaired because the chair was absent. Uh, uh, and members feel, issues which are raised, members feel need to be brought to the attention of this council and to cabinet because a fundamental difference has emerged 
between members on our review management committee and officers in respect of the draft bullying and harassment policy, with a seeming reluctance by officers to accept overview management committee's desire for the appointment of an independent person outside of the council for employees to make compa complaints to when they feel they have been bullied and harassed. Now, the minute in question is this um, minute uh, on page 22. Um, the committee commented on bullying and harassment that there was no mention, it says, of an independent person outside of the council for complaints to be made to. Then it says the committee were advised that in the draft policy, there were mechanisms in place for staff to use different routes making a complaint, which included ACAS, bullying at work organization and trade unions. Now, that phrase, the committee were advised that, could be written or paraphrased in another way. It could be written in the way that says, officers disagreed and wanted to squash that particular idea, because that's how it feels to members. After members had expressed their views at this meeting on the 9th of June, it was then agreed that prior to cabinet considering the new policy, overview management wanted to pre-scrutinize it at the meeting on the 14th of July, before cabinet finally endorses it in September. And when this did come back to overview management on the 14th of July, there was, to put it mildly, extreme disquiet. The officers were pushing on without an independent person and hadn't taken any cognizance of comments made on the 9th of June, showing, in the, in the view of many members, a complete disregard for the strongly held will of the elected members. Now, the evidence is there on YouTube. Um, many, many of the members made passionate speeches on this, and I'm not going to articulate those views now. I will let others do that as part of this if they wish to do so. Because bringing this item here today to let council know what's going on has widespread support across all the political groups. And I'm sure that members will show you how they feel. Instead, what I want to do, rather than talking about that specific uh, role of the independent person, is refer instead to the peer challenge where it says in that review, quote, the council's elected members are committed and engaged with their communities, but their leadership role within the council needs strengthening and they should play a far greater role in policy development and decision making, as well as providing leadership from the front. Members, it says, need to be at the core of decision making in the council and need to be adequately supported by senior officers to enable them to exercise their democratic responsibilities. Now, as the person who chaired overview management on the 14th of July, I would just like cabinet to ponder this. Overview management has no decision making powers, but it can make recommendations to cabinet. And this item has been delayed coming to cabinet so that our pre-scrutiny could take place on the 14th of July, which is why you, you've not considered it already. I think it was supposed to be considered last time. It's now coming before you in September. So, you know, we brought it here because we assume that you are interested in our opinions as elected members on overview management committee. And so I say to the leader now and to the members of his cabinet here today, yeah, 30 seconds. when you consider this draft policy in September and you see no mention of an independent person for employees to complain to, if they feel they're being bullied, ask yourself, do you want to see a democratically elected members at the heart of the decision making process with our clear strategic steer acted upon? Or are you going to allow officers to override that and have it their way? It's your call. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Healy. I would remind uh, members that you have five minutes to speak on this item. You will note it's not up on the screen, but uh, I can be, I am assured that uh, Sam has a timing device. Uh, Councillor Jump. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as I was one of the original councillors who raised the issue of an independent local arbiter, I fully support this accepted minute. When the, <clears throat> excuse me, when the peer report was published, councillor Owen was quoted as saying, there's been no sudden flood of bullying complaints. One asks, why should have there been, when at no point of contact is perceived as being truly independent? 
Current policy lists numerous external organizations, including national organizations such as ACAS and the National Bullying Helpline. These national organizations are staffed by people who probably have no ideas to the whereabouts of the East Riding of Yorkshire, let alone the ethos or employment history of the authority. They're manned by faceless people doing their best. But with the best will in the world, this is not good enough for our employees. Even local org organizations have the corporate stigma attached to this type of advice. And again, in the main, contact will be either by phone or remote access at best. We appear to lack empathy with those who have employment problems. Not everyone is or wishes to be a member of a union. Unions can be seen by some as not being totally independent, as union members are working in the same building as management are, and are employees of the authority. We've raised this issue several times and been rebuffed by the argument that those authorities that we have consulted use the same standard list as printed in our proposed policy. What is to stop us offering a better, more open opportunity to our staff if they had an employment grievance? Why do we have to follow the herd? Our proposal is to appoint a locally based qualified person, an employment law expert perhaps, who could be contacted by phone and if required, have a friendly meeting face to face. They could be paid a stipend based on a number of cases or a retainer and it could be piloted for a few years to measure the take up and its effectiveness. If the service is not used or is ineffective, then it is closed. But at least we, have, we will have shown the council tried and cared. Incidents of bullying and nepotism, however small, are shameful. And we should use this opportunity to repair the damage and be seen to go the extra mile for our hardworking workforce. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jump. Councillor Andy Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There can be no doubt that members were strongly in favour of establishing a local independent route for all staff. I would just draw the attention, please, Mr. Chairman, of members of that cabinet. As printed here on page 22, it's clear which bullet point we're talking about. I would draw your attention to the very next one, which is entitled Strengthening Pre-Scrutiny. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Walker. There being no other speakers, can I call upon Councillor Healy to close the debate? Bearing omission from it. And it is the will of democratically elected members that this person is appointed and is part of it. So our plea is to cabinet when you are considering this. You have the decision making authority. Are you going to allow officers to deny officers to deny councillors what we believe is right for employees who feel bullied and harassed? Or are you going to allow officers to tell you how it should be? You need to ponder that carefully, in our view, because a lot rides upon it. Thank you. I, I move the accepted minute. Thank you, Councillor Healy. Councillor Owen. Yeah, yes, forgive me. I keep pushing a button and a star appears and then vanishes. You know, so uh, I apologise, <laughs> Councillor Healy, for coming in after him. It did, uh, if that's okay. It did but, puzzle me, Councillor Owen. Yeah. Um, just to say, yes, I mean, the whole point of having scrutiny is so that Cabinet takes notice of what members are saying. When I first pushed to have the LGA peer review because of various perceptions there were amongst officers and members, one of the outcomes was to look at the relationship between us. And I think that's progressing well. We've had a lot of lessons to be learned. And as I say, you know, cabinet will look at the recommendations that come from scrutiny. We've heard today your concerns. And I promise as chair of the cabinet to make sure they are considered fully and properly. And we do listen to, you know, the wishes of members. 
And that's all I can say at this stage, but I will have time to contemplate over recess, I'm sure, before it does come to Cabinet. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Did you want to close the debate again, Councillor Healy? Thanks. Uh, and we respect them, and I'm sure you will give it a consideration. We, we urge you to do so, and thank you for listening to us today. Thank you. I move the minute to be, to be uh, accepted. Thank you, Councillor Healy. I will now take the vote. All those in favour, please show. Those against? Any abstentions? Thank you. That is carried. Accepted Minute Health and Wellbeing Board, Councillor Owen to move and speak. Councillor Aiken? Yes, and I would be happy to second. Councillor Owen? Yes, thank you, Chairman. And, and again, just very briefly, I'm, I'm referring to uh, the minute I've accepted, which is talking about um, the cost of living and the impact on the most vulnerable. And I only highlight it because I think the Health and Wellbeing Board, which has been around for a number of years, is sometimes underestimated as to the role it can play. Because those of you that have been around quite a number of years will remember the old local strategic partnerships that used to take place. Uh, which used to have members of the fire, the voluntary sector, the police, the probation, the NHS, but were a very valuable way of bringing all those partner agencies together. Particularly in the cost of living crisis, it was made quite evident to us at the Health and Wellbeing Board, the amount of work being done across that range of partners. And it is still my belief that that is one of the best forums for bringing all those people together and will continue to be so. When I come on to my leader's uh, report in a couple of minutes' time, I'll build on that a little bit because we have strengthened our health and well-being board by, again, opening it up to more partner agencies to come and be part. And I see, still see that as one of the main focuses and debating chambers of looking after our vulnerable communities, particularly as the, the role of the likes of our public health team and people in our benefits teams work closer and closer together I just thought I would reflect that, you know, this cost of living crisis has been around for a while. We are aware of it and there are forums where we can actually debate the issues moving forward. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for the trailer. Nobody else to speak. Uh, do you require to close the debate or shall we just go straight on to the vote? I will now take the vote then. All those in favour, please show. Thank you. Those against? Thank you. And abstentions? No abstentions. So thank you. That is carried. And we move on to item eight and the aforementioned leaders update. Councillor Owen, uh, you have 10 minutes. Chairman, um, and as I just said, on the 1st of July this year, the NHS launched their new integrated care systems across the country. Seeing the demise of the clinical commissioning groups, and introducing a whole new way of working. I've always been the first to say that we are not the NHS, nor have we any control over their functioning other than lobbying, persuasion, and the use of our scrutiny functions. We do, however, have close working relationships at the interface between health and social care, and the NHS commissioned many service, services from us, particularly through leisure services and they work very closely with our public health teams. I was criticized when I took over as leader of the council for saying that the NHS will be one of my priorities, and then at the same time saying we have no control over it. But now I can explain why I had that interest at that time. I'm always quite annoyed whenever there is an election and I read leaflets saying how we're gonna save local services, especially hospitals, and then do absolutely nothing to follow up on promises. When elected, time and time again, in the full knowledge that people are powerless to do anything about it. And I just say delivering pieces of paper is not the same as delivering results, which has been proven on many occasions. However, the new vision from the NHS through the new integrated care systems gives potentially the largest glimmer of hope we have had for many years about working together. 
For the first time, there is a greater emphasis on ill health prevention, tackling inequalities, and working closer with local government with a focus on the wider issues, including socioeconomic development, housing, employment, and the environment. I'd like to just set the scene with a bit of an overview of the new system and then explain how we will have a much stronger role as local government to work collaboratively in the system and how we will intend to take a lead in the East Riding. The new Humber and North Yorkshire integrated care system comprises of six places, which are the local authority areas of York, North Yorkshire, East Riding, Hull, North and North East Lincolnshire. It is huge in scale. 1.7 million people, around 50,000 staff working in health and adult social care, four acute hospital trusts, three mental health trusts, four community non-for-profit providers, 42 primary care networks containing 101 GP practices, two ambulance trusts, 550 care homes, 180 care home companies, 10 hospices, and thousands of voluntary and community sector organizations. However, what is of paramount importance to me is its budget, 3.5 billion pounds a year. Its mission is to improve outcomes, tackle inequalities, enhance quality and productivity, and support social and economic recovery. So how is it structured? It has an overarching integrated care board, directly accountable for the NHS spend and accountable to the NHS and performance. And it will have representatives from NHS trusts, primary care and local authorities. The integrated care board works symbiotically alongside an integrated care partnership, which is where we become much more involved because the integrated care partnership is made up of representation from those six places, i.e. the six local authority areas. And it is the forum that brings together all the wider determinants of health, such as economic development, housing, education, leisure, and through its individual, what are called joint strategic needs assessments and the work of the six health and well-being boards, it will develop an integrated care strategy to address the health, social care and public health needs of the system as a whole. It will take a collective approach to decision making and support mutual accountability across the system. The makeup of this partnership will be quite powerful. Six place committee chairs who will be the six chief executives of the six local authorities. Six elected members likely to be the chairs of the health and wellbeing board or leaders of those councils and six NHS, NHS place leads, a representative from Health Watch, and it will be chaired by the chair of the integrated care system and the chief exec and the vice chair will be from local government and also have a seat on the board of the main board of the integrated care system. The other five local authority leaders have asked me to take on that role. So I'll be sitting on that integrated care partnership as the vice chair and on the main board. This partnership will advise the board on how it wishes to deliver its integrated care strategy, will represent place, partnership policy and the public voice. This partnership will be fully established by September and will meet formally for the first time in October. This partnership will be a strong voice for local government in putting the case for our local priorities and expenditure. And if true to its word, will be a huge step forward in collaborative working. It will actively work to involve other partner agencies and the communities and the voluntary sector for the well-being of all our communities. I actually had a good meeting with Chris Blacksell, Chief Fire Officer, only a few days ago on other issues and he was excited about the opportunities for the collaborative working that he could already see. At my suggestion, the first priorities will be developing understanding between the partners with sessions running around walking in your shoes, which means where NHS staff will be educated in the world of local government and of social care and local government will be educated in the world of the NHS. 
this cultural awareness between partner organizations will help break down organizational barriers. The NHS providers, that's the acute hospitals, will form collaboratives of their own to help deliver the system's strategic priorities, as well as closer working together across the system and with neighboring systems. Hopefully the new system will prevent budgets being swallowed up by the hospital trusts as they struggle to get on top of their backlogs. Because now for the first time tackling those inequalities, looking at the economic development of the area will also be responsibility of the NHS. I am optimistic that we will have much better outcomes and dialogue than we had in the past. However, I will end on a stark note with respect to hospital waiting lists. We were given an update at our last Health and Wellbeing Board, and as of May this year, Hull University Teaching Hospitals, that's Hull Royal Infirmary to you and I and Castle Hill, had a waiting list of 69,556. That's across all disciplines and areas. And although they are slowly tackling the issues, in my mind, that's 69,556 people with families waiting for treatment of one form or another, as well as those who haven't even yet bothered to see a GP or to seek advice through COVID. I'm going to end there, but the main point is I think these new place partnerships, again, a bit like the health and wellbeing boards, will be the place we can really tackle and discuss some of these cost of living crisis issues across the patch, and hopefully the dawn of a new light of us having some more influence on those services in the NHS. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Uh, we now have 10 minutes allocated uh, for questions appertaining to Councillor Owen's oral report. And we have Councillor Nolan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I listened with interest to, to Councillor Owen and he referred to leaflets going out, making promises about hospitals. I'm assuming he's referring to Greg Knight MP, who in 28 made promises that the Conservatives got back in, services would be returned back to Bridlington. Now, 12 years on, they're still waiting. So perhaps you can have a quiet word with, with uh, Greg Knight about making political promises about hospitals. Thank you, Councillor Nolan. Councillor Hammond. Sorry, Councillor Norman. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you for the update, uh, Leader. Um, as you know, there are issues of health inequalities across the East Riding, and I just want to ask the leader how we will ensure that these inequalities are tackled um, through the new ISP, and please come back to us when you've got some news. Councillor Owen. I think one of the early signs of the first two board meetings I attended, one in one was a shadow board, one the first introductory board, and then a proper board meeting was sitting around the table. I was expecting all the discussion debate, as it always has been in the past with the NHS, to be about hospitals, waiting lists, and all sorts of bits and pieces like that. The debate was actually about health inequalities. We had the representative from Director of Public Health from North Yorkshire sits on the board. And what was surprising to me, uh, although it shouldn't have been really, was how little understanding some very senior people in the NHS have of the real inequalities on the ground, the difference in life expectancy, the difference in different areas. And it was as though some, some of them were hearing it for the first time. So we're having those debates as local authorities or places. We've got all the information there. We, we've got the data. It's just actually feeding that forward, pulling it together and making people aware of what these issues are. Then we can get around, well, where do you put the investment in to tackle some of those root cause problems? And I think that collective of maybe six local authorities with a huge budget, we can actually use some of that funding to do a mapping exercise and really get to the heart of some of these things we can do. It's very, very early days. But I'm more optimistic than pessimistic at this moment in time. And as soon as I know any more, I'll feed it back. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Chair. Can the leader just make it absolutely clear, please, that unlike MPs who can influence NHS services, as a local authority and as councillors, we have no control over frontline NHS services like hospitals. However, this Conservative-led authority will continue 
to keep lobbying on behalf of the people of Bridlington, Driffield, Beverly, and all the other hostels in our area to make sure we protect local services. Absolutely, and I think if we get down to the nitty gritty, there are a lot of services actually being offered in those areas at the moment. It's just how we, sometimes you distort the information to say it, it's not there. So I think clarity uh, and an acceptance of transparency moving forward, and I totally agree, you know, we will continue lobbying. And at the end of the day, you know, it's balancing the resources that are there with the need. And I think we like talking about conservatives, you know, we've got enough common sense to know how we can balance those priorities priorities for everybody's benefit. Thank you. Councillor Linda Bayram. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm on the Health Committee, as you well know. Um, and all we keep saying is to the health service, communicate with your residents. People don't know where to go for anything, really. We've had all these new things set up. Will this new board ensure that everybody knows where to go when they are poorly? Councillor Owen? They certainly realise communications is probably one of the main areas that they need to work on, has been for a long time. And, uh, yep, it, it's up there at the top of the agenda of, of, of making sure information is flowing and is transparent. And even in a language we can all understand, which isn't always obviously the case. Councillor Harold. Thank you, Chair. I just wondered whether the leader um, would agree with me that our public health team within the council hold a wealth of information and intelligence and just whether he could share how um, they will work together with the new boards moving forward. Can I just say that none of these questions are planted, by the way, so I <laughs> to sort of give some response. That, thanks, Kerry. Yeah. The way the public health team will work is that they're the ones that control what's called the joint strategic needs assessment for the area. The six areas will come together with their joint strategic needs assessments, and they're going into great detail. They go into you know, economic issues, they go to jobs, creation, age profiles, all sorts of things. And they will come together, the six areas, to come with this system-wide approach. The big problems are going to be that some some issues are across the whole patch, the 1.7 million people. That could be ambulance services, transport, you know, connectivity. Some will be very localised to the likes of ourselves, say coastal health with maybe North Yorkshire. So there'll be lots of different things at lots of different levels. And it'll be actually the public health teams that have the data and the intelligence to actually pull those apart and, and you know, advise us then as to how we can tackle some of those areas. Thank you very much, Councillor Owen, for your, your update. We now move on to item nine, questions under procedure rules seven, eight, little i. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Chair. Will the leader on behalf of this council write to the Secretary of State for Transport and ask the Secretary to change the law to allow for the for speed limit repeater size to be installed on roads with streetlights? which unless currently exempt are officially restricted to 30 miles per hour. And as such, currently cannot have 30 mile an hour repeater signs installed on them. This question is asked in the knowledge that whilst in theory, road users should all know that roads with streetlights unless exempt are restricted to 30 miles per hour. However, in reality, not all do know this, causing safety issues for themselves and other road users. Thank you, Chair. To respond, we have Kath Councillor Matthews. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hammond, for this question. Want to read the answer? <laughs> uh, regarding changes to the UK traffic regulations, council officers follow the legislation set out in the Road Traffic Act 1984 and are not in a position to do otherwise. Changes to the regulation may, as is likely in this case, result in considerable financial pressure on the council's budget and staffing resources and would need to be supported by nationally available funding. You will be aware that all changes to legislation must move through parliament 
and our path following extensive investigations and discussions. The existing laws regarding the 30 mile an hour repeaters have been in place since 1934 and have been included in driving theory via the highway code since then. Ignorance, I'm afraid, of the law is not a defence, and any driver exceeding the 30 mile an hour limit in a restricted road is liable to prosecution by the police. The highway code is very clear in regards to this matter, and rule 124 states clearly that a speed limit of 30 mile an hour generally applies to all roads with streetlights. Of course, this excludes motorways and less than show otherwise. In saying all that, I am willing on behalf of this council to raise your concerns regarding the lack of speed limit repeater signs on roads with street light with the Secretary of State in the interest of road safety. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Matthews. Do you require a supplementary, Councillor Hammond? No, thank you, Chair. Right, thank you. Move on to Councillor Nolan. As long as one of us is doing it. Uh, okay. Does the leader of the council not recognise that if council staff are routinely opening and vetting emails sent to councillors and then blocking those which they deem to be political, including in one case a link to the Yorkshire Post news, that it is wholly unacceptable, it reinforces the impression that this is an officer-led council and should cease with immediate effect. To respond, we have Councillor Handley. Thank you, Chair. I understand that what prompted this question today was an email that was sent by the leader of the Liberal Democrat group to member services, asking them to forward the email to all councillors. In the email was a link to a newspaper story about the result of the recent by-election in Bridlington North. Staff in member services are employed to support members in their work as councillors. Staff cannot use their time and resource of this council to deal with matters that are deemed political. Whilst the newspaper article that Councillor Nolan wanted to circulate is factual in nature, he was requesting that it be sent to all councillors. The intention behind was deemed by officers to be political and as such officers cannot be seen to be involved in its circulation to other members. There is no question of emails being blocked by officers. Councillor Noland and indeed any member can of course send such emails from their private accounts if they so wish. If such requests are made, they will be refused by officers and it is entirely appropriate that they are refused. And I would remind Councillor Nolan that the Member Code of Conduct of this Council states that members should ensure that the resources of the Council are not used improperly for political purposes. Officers in member services draft communications for members. They also receive emails for members and forward them on. They perform the same role as management assistants and I can see nothing wrong in officers opening emails intended for councillors as part of this. The majority of members, I am sure, are very appreciative of the support they are given by member services and I do not agree that the processes followed demonstrate that the council is officer-led. On the contrary, it shows members and officers working together very well and very effectively. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hanley. Uh, I'm assuming you wish to ask a supplementary question, Councillor Nolan. Supplementary. Um, is Councillor Hanley aware that actually I send the email from my private email account? I didn't send it from a council uh, account. It was sent from outside this council to councillors. Those emails were blocked by the staff. That's my issue, is officers reading emails sent between councillors and vetoing them. Do you 
I would point out there's only one speaker in this. Councillor Handley, we're we passing. Okay. All I was going to say, Chair, was yes, I was aware of that, but it was still sent through the group office. Thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have supplementary supplementary questions, Councillor Nolan. So we'll move on through this tome of papers I have before me uh, to Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chair. With winter approaching, does the leader accept that the East Riding of Yorkshire Council should be making plans for providing or enabling places of refuge for those who will be most affected by the forthcoming unprecedented increases in energy costs, which, despite the government assistance given to residents, could lead to serious health impacts and even deaths? Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Owen. Yes, thank you, Councillor Johnson. I do accept that we do need to be doing all we can to ensure that the vulnerable are catered for in the current time of increased energy costs, particularly as we come into the winter months. In terms of places of refuge, uh, I know our culture and leisure services see both our leisure centres and libraries as safe and warm places where people can socialise and be welcomed. And the council does and will be providing a range of support through many of our other services, such as our welfare visiting team and others to identify people at risk. But we will also be working closely with partners in the voluntary community social enterprise sector to see where gaps in provision are. I also personally, this is not an advice from anybody, believe there will be a role for our town and parish councils in this. And I believe we will need to be thinking a lot harder and communicating with people over the next few months. That's my personal view on this. And can I assure you that I'll progress in more detail what our specific plans are and feedback. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Councillor Johnson, do you wish a supplementary? If, if I may, please. By all means. It's good news that the council has put aside £4.4 million, which the, uh, which the Cabinet has set aside for future assistance programmes for those vulnerable and in need. Could some of that be used for places of refuge? Councillor Owen. I'm sure I mean, the £4.4 million isn't the only money we've got and won't be the only money we've got available. And I think if we can define exactly what a place of refuge is, that's just one of the sort of schemes we would want to be looking at for the use of that sort of money. And that's no promises, but, you know, I do promise that we'll look more deeply into what's needed and what, and what could be supplied in months to come. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Councillor Davison. Thank you, Chair. Does the leader recognise that the draft local plan review consultation can still be an opportunity to affect the proposed allocations for housing, etc., and that the reported comments from councillors Meredith, Hammond and Holmes, with, with which I agree, emphasise that point? Whereas the planning officer's report to Environment and Regeneration, OSC, which talks about comments being within a specific remit, such as soundness, legal compliance, positively prepared and consistent with national policy, gives a negative impression to the public who wish to comment about the impact on their community of proposed new de developments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Davison. Councillor Holmes. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Davison. Um, I will try to answer this question as best I can, given the limitations in the way that it's worded. The question refers to reported comments from councillors Meredith, Hammond and Holmes, but it does not say when and where these comments were reported. Uh, and so it's not clear to me from this question as it's worded, which comments I'm being asked to contrast with the planning officer's report. Uh, are they comments that we made at Environment and Regeneration? Are they comments in the minutes or in the press? Um, none of us have given a press interview, and so I've not been able to narrow it down that way. But I can answer regarding language used in the planning officer's report, because that's a document identified. The local plan regulation 19 consultation and the way that it's undertaken is set out in planning legislation. At this consultation takes place with a view to the updated plan going before an inspector who will ask him or herself, is it sound? Committees and members of the public deserve to be well informed and to be given as much assistance as possible regarding what an inspector will subsequently look for. 
And so it's right that officers make that criteria clear in their report. If a member of the public does not agree that the plan is sound, for example, due to a specific allocation for housing, then this report is of great assistance to them because it makes it clear that they should explain why they don't believe the plan fulfills the criteria and to refer to legal compliance, consistency with national policy, and it being positive, whether it's positively prepared. However, all comments received, all comments received at Regulation 19 stage are included in the library of information sent to the appointed planning inspector who will examine the plan. And the consultation form will also ask whether respondents may wish to attend the examination hearing sessions if requested by the planning inspector, which would give them an opportunity to directly advise the planning inspector of their concerns. To undertake the consultation in any other way would not be compliant with Regulation 19. And very significant consultation has been undertaken in relation to the review of the local plan to date. Now, of course, it's entirely a matter for Councillor Davison but in order to allow me to answer the whole of his question, as I very much wish to do so, I invite him to identify where the reports, where the comments were reported, so that um, he can ask me as a supplementary question to comment on those specific and identified comments. Thank you, Councillor Holmes. Councillor Davison, do you have a supplementary? I do now. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, um, May I inform uh, uh, Councillor Holmes that there was a, a full trade spread in the Hull Daily Mail, which had uh, the photographs of these esteemed councillors uh, making the comments, which were about, let's hope we get 350,000, I think it was, figure responses, because I believe that those councillors um, felt that this consultation could change some things that were set down in concrete. And when we talk about section 19, whatever you said, um, that, uh, that sounded a bit, a bit, yeah, uh, not welcoming of comments to the extent that the councillors would. Thank you for your clarification, Councillor Davison. Councillor Holmes. I haven't seen the hard copy in the newspaper, but I have seen by chance uh, what was online. Uh, and so working on the basis that they will be largely consistent with each other. Uh, I know that it was reported that Councillor Hammond said that it was a very important document. I agree with that. Uh, I know it made reference to the comment uh, of, we hope we get 350,000 responses. And I agree, you cannot have too many responses in relation to a consultation. Thank you, Councillor Holmes. And thank you, Councillor Davis. Move on to Councillor Padden. Thank you, Chair. Afternoon, gentlemen, ladies. I'd like to read Covenant from the Armed Forces, published on the Royal British Legion's website. An enduring covenant between the people of the United Kingdom. Excuse me, Councillor Pellon. Sorry, you... I do apologise, Chair. Wrong bit of paper. I'd I like know. to, uh, as read, I'd like to read, I'd like to comment. As read in the, the portfolio, and I'll comment later. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Matthews. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, Councillor Padden, I share the same annoyance. Yeah. Thank you for your introduction, Councillor right. Nolan. Does the leader not share the annoyance and upset of residents of the continuing insurgence of travellers onto sites such as the land next to St Thomas More Primary School? which is in Hull, by the way, near Anleby, and also the Holton Price Sports Centre when they're left there. And can he give an insurance that this council will use all measures within his power, including those in the recent police crime sentence in court, which was the 28th of last month, Act 2022, to evict and deter such behaviours? And I'd like to ask another question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pallon. Now we've elucidated what the question is. Councillor Matthews, would you care to answer it? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes and yes. Yes, I share the same annoyance and upset of residents by travellers, travellers setting up a camp on such sites. Last week, 
we had two such incursions in Bridlington, one in the Old Town Ward and one in my own ward and the events fields at Suaby. I'm sure that all members will understand the concerns that residents feel when unlawful encampments causes problems for the community through behaviours such as causing noise problems or leaving refuge behind. And as previously stated, the Sorby and Bridlington residents have just experienced that same behaviour. Officers seek to prevent problems of encampments by protecting vulnerable sites to make them more difficult to enter. They also respond to a vast majority of encampments on council owned land by taking swift and proportionate action within the legal powers that are open to us. And I think I must emphasize that they've got to act within the law. The Police and Crime, Police, Crime, Sentencing and Courts Act 2022 amends the police powers in relation to encampments. And our officers have already contacted police colleagues in order to understand how they intend to use these new provisions. How are they going to use the provisions? They may have the provisions, but we need to know when and where they're going to use them. I can assure you in the meantime, our officers will continue to respond accordingly and within the law. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Matthews. I understand you have a supplementary, Councillor Patton. I do, thank you, Chair. Um, the answer to that is yes. And can we ask democratic services to put notices up when we know what the law is to deter these people from ingressing onto the ground? Thank you. That's throughout East Riding. Councillor Matthews? I think that the answer to that, we need to examine that before we, we actually implement it. We had the debate the other day about putting notices up for uh, planning enforcement and planning issues. And uh, we just got to be careful on that. Uh, I don't want to be littering the whole countryside up with notices. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Matthews. Move on to Councillor Harold. Thank you, Chairman. Does the leader agree with me that the recent nominations at the LGC Awards by three of our teams, especially our Dreams team, who were named winners in the health and social care category, shows that when such innovation, foresight, and effective use of collaborative working is used, these great achievements and outcomes can be made for our residents. Thank you, Councillor Harold. Councillor Owen. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I do agree that the recent nominations at the LGC Awards by three of our teams, especially our Dreams team, who were named winners in the health and social care category, shows that when, as you say, such innovation, foresight and effective use of collaborative working is used, these great achievements and outcomes can be made for our residents. The digital record enabling and management support at DREAMS team is a fantastic example of partnership and collaborative working to improve quality of care for residents in our care homes across the region. Led by our digital change and technology and our adult social care unit at the council, working with our new partners from Hull and East Riding Care Association and Humber and North Yorkshire Integrated Care System, and this partnership working uh, resulted in this result. The DREAMS team are working on a one-to-one -one basis with care providers across the Humber and North Yorkshire integrated care system to become more digitally enabled by providing tailored support aligned with the recently developed digital maturity ladder, that's which people can actually go up when they get more experience in using digital systems, which has already been recognized in less than six months as best practice nationally. The subsequent progression of care homes up this digital maturity ladder will see an overall increase in skills throughout the workforce, which will support the adoption of new and beneficial tools and ways of working within the sector. This will allow the introduction of more streamlined processes within care homes, increasing efficiencies, improving sustainability, and enabling the delivery of improved person-centered care for residents. The team have already been successful in a number of funding bids to directly support care providers in areas such as infrastructure development and equipment provision. Over the next three years, this model will be scaled up to include domiciliary and community providers, 
And I think it's fair just to say at the end that it was unanimously awarded the award by the judges, one of the only entries that was, and they said it was national best practice and should be shared nationally. So yeah, I do congratulate the team for their award and hopefully this is a sign of things to come in partnership working. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Councillor Harold, are you desirous of a supplementary? Right, we move on to Councillor Boynton. Would the leader of the council agree with me that the refurbishment of the children's play parks all over the East Riding, with the 600,000 from capital funds and 500,000 uh, from the commuted sums is money well spent? Play parks are a safe space which contributes to physical, mental health uh, for our young people, allow emotional and cognitive development and encourage independence. Thank you, Councillor Boynton. Councillor Owen, to respond. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, and I wholeheartedly agree with Councillor Boynton that this funding to upgrade and refurbish children's play parks across the East Riding has been very well spent. I would like to demonstrate why this investment has been made and the benefits it will bring. Play England have a charter for children's play and describes play as what children and young people do when they follow their own ideas and interests in their own way and for their own reasons. Play has also been described like this as what children and young people do when they're not being told what to do by adults. Play is an essential part of every child's life and is vital for the enjoyment of childhood, as well as social, emotional, intellectual and physical development. When children are asked about what they think is important in their lives, playing and friends are usually at the top of the list. Public playgrounds provide many learning opportunities through different types of play. Outdoor play allows for physical, social, emotional, imaginative and cognitive development. And for example, the physical activity involved in playing at a playground improves health and well-being, while the safe environment encourages independence. There are many wider benefits of good play provision for families and communities too. And much evidence suggests that parents can feel more secure knowing that their children are happy, safe and enjoying themselves. Families benefit from healthier, happier children. Playing outside freely and regularly helps to combat childhood obesity rates and contributes to better long-term health in adulthood. Playgrounds are frequently seen as a focal point for communities and play offers opportunities for social interaction for the wider community and supports the development of a greater sense of community spirit promoting social cohesion. Public outdoor spaces have an important role in the everyday lives of children and young people, especially as a place for meeting friends. This council recognises the values of investing in our playgrounds and those of our partners, such as town and parish councils. And this funding of over a million pounds has allowed us to update those playgrounds in most need to make sure these benefits can be realised. Work is currently underway at numerous sites with the aim to fully complete this ambitious refurbishment programme by March 2023. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Councillor Boynton, do you have a supplementary question? Response. Thank you very much, Councillor Boynton. Move on to Councillor Heslop Mullins. In the past year, the councillor stopped providing councillors with links to media news stories so that they are no longer aware of what is being said about this council. Does the leader not accept that members should once again receive links to news stories about the council? Thank you, Councillor Heslop Mullins. Uh, Councillor Handley to respond. Thank you, Chair. The PR team no longer buy or scan local daily or weekly papers for council related content, nor do they manually scan these papers and share related links with anyone. This was reviewed over six months ago and determined to be an antiquated practice that had lost relevance in today's 24-7, 365 news context. Given that it is now possible for everyone to receive immediate news notifications via the Google Alert system at no cost to the taxpayer. It was simply 
not possible to justify the continue, continued use of council resources to continue to provide this outdated and unnecessary service. Google Alerts are more effective, much quicker, more timely than a manual daily and weekly scan of the papers and are available to everyone at no charge, providing links in real time as news happens 24 7 365. In addition, the proportion of local and regional media content now available online leaves the summarising of printed media content somewhat redundant because it is immediately out of date as compared to the online versions of content which is often updated numerous times after publication. By stopping the purchase of daily and weekly papers, we have saved the council the not insignificant cost of purchasing daily and weekly newspapers, as well as reduce the organisational newspaper licensing fee by £12,000 per annum. This substantial cost was creating an over, overspend against budgets, and this has now been removed. If any councillors would appreciate a training session on getting the best out of Google Alerts, the PR team would be happy to put on a short ses a session together for them. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Handley. Do we have a supplementary councillor, Heslop Mullins? Thank you very much. Uh, I am aware, councillors, I have been a little remiss. Um, I have not as yet invited members who wish to divest themselves of their jackets due to the warmth. You are more than welcome to do so. Do please be aware I'm unable to divest myself of mine. Item 10 is outside body questions. No questions have been received. Item 11 is portfolio holder reports. Councillor Harold, the portfolio holder for adults, health and well-being, will make an oral report, which will last for a maximum of five minutes. Thank you, Councillor Harold. Thank you very much, Chair. I will use my 300 seconds very wisely. So I'm going to take that opportunity, if I can, to just um, inform members about a visit that I had earlier, um, late last month, and then in the early beginning of this month. So I was lucky enough to go to Wearkling. Oh, and just before I start, do apologise. There are some slides that is just the leaflet, the booklet that goes out along with Wearkling, and it's only for your perusal while I'm speaking because it's much more um, interesting than myself. However, I will have this sent around to everybody so they can have that. So don't worry too much if you miss anything. So Wearkling is a specialist learning disability employment service established in 2004 to meet our duties as a local authority to promote employment for people with a learning disability and autism identified in the government's white paper, Valuing People, a new strategy for learning disability in the 21st century, and more recently focusing on the preparing for adulthood agenda. Wearclink has got two bases that covers the whole of the East Riding. Its main base is in Cottingham, which has various facilities that include a function or training room, a cafe which is open to the public and you must, must go, um, a woodwork workshop area, extensive gardens with different specific areas such as polytunnels for growing and a beautiful memory garden. Also community allotment that's, that's supported and maintained by the residents of Cottingham. It's based at Subi Hall is based on a different model, more like a garden centre that simply grows and sells plants. The service performs three key functions, a therapeutic day service for a smaller number of people with a learning disability, a base to support job search, and more importantly, a training facility for people wanting to understand and experience what work is like before they enter the job market. The job coaching element offers advice and support when looking for work, CV and application form support, also one-to-one -one coaching when attending interviews. Workling consists of 15 staff across both sites, which include employment training coordinators, support workers, caretaker, team, and a senior manager who oversee both of the sites. Workling allows self-referrals from East Riding residents themselves or from our social work teams. They must want to work, and they must have a social care need that's identified in the Care Act 2014. 188 people currently 
ranging from 18 to the over 60s are supported by Worklink and they liaise with over 50 local businesses and that doesn't even include the volunteering positions that some take up. We are limited by national performance measures which is known as ASCOF which is the Adult Social Care Outcomes Framework and they have a national figure of 5.6% and the population and employment that we currently have at the moment is 6.3. So although we're doing really well, the team are not resting on their laurels and they really want to work on that and improve. These figures don't take into account those people with a learning disability who work 16 hours or more and who do not have social care support and so aren't counted. So like with the free school meals, there are a cohort there that we don't actually know about that the team are going out to try and find. Our focus is now on the modernisation of the learning disability offer, which it will, will hopefully increase information for young people leaving school, help young people to aspire for work by increasing the supported internship offer all over private and public sector, challenging aspirations, enhancing futures plus, adding a project worker to the Worklink team that will link to, e link to economic development. We're hoping to add two whole time equivalent workers to Google and also the development of a business case for an increase in job coach staff within Worklink. As you can see, the team are keen to do all they can to increase the life chances for our residents with a learning disability and encourage them into their community in the world of work. To be valued is a wonderful feeling and a visit to either site will not disappoint. Please, please take the time to visit either the cafe in Cottingham or the garden centre in Subi. Have a come in within time, Chair. It's the first Harold. time for everything. Many thanks. Councillor Harold, I, I applaud you. You have, 20 seconds, you have 20 seconds remaining if you wish to add any more. Uh, we now go on to questions of Councillor Harold. We have 10 minutes allocated for questions. Are there any questions which members wish to ask? Right. If there are no questions, thank you again for your report, Councillor Harold. Uh, we'll move on to Councillor Aitkin, the portfolio holder, children and young people's education. Health and well-being, and she will Not make an chance. oral report. That clock started, and I haven't started. Which, <laughs> which we'll just have to Reset. make up for it, Councillor Aitken. Good and afternoon, members. Today, uh, I'll do my best to stick to the short five minutes set aside for a portfolio update. My subject today is East Riding fostering. I believe there is a great opportunity for some of our residents to join in the emotionally positive opportunity to become an East Riding foster carer supported by many different services and a, and a fostering allowance. There are no age limits, no gender requirements. We just need to engage with people who love children, who enjoy the positive power children bring to all our lives. And I would ask you to help me encourage our residents to make those first steps and ask those first nervous questions about how they can become an East Riding foster carer. Nationally, there are record numbers of children in care and around 15% of our foster carer workforce are retiring or leaving every year. The frightening figure Fostering Network estimates that fostering services across the UK need to recruit at least a further 9,300 foster families in the next 12 months alone. And we, meet, we need to make up some of those numbers here in East Yorkshire. East Riding currently has 357 looked after children aged 0 to 8. 41 children are fostered by 32 approved connected person foster carers. These are people who have a close or family connection already established with the child. 112 children are fostered by 100 mainstream foster carers. These are people who don't have a previous connection to the child. However, in addition to these foster carers, we have 43 children and young people who are being fostered by independent fostering agencies with an average cost of £871 per week, over £45,000 per year per child. That equates to nearly £2 million a year. And 15 children and young people are placed in external residential placements with an average cost of £5,152 per week almost £270,000 per child per year. That equates to over 4 million a year. By recruiting more foster families, 
we not only significantly reduce the financial burden on our local authority, we enable children and young people to have a wider choice of families to be placed with here in our local area, and also to improve the likelihood of a longer lasting and a happier foster family experience. It's a win-win. Being a foster parent means caring for a child as part of your family. To become a foster parent, you need to be a UK resident, able to take care of a child or young person, often on a full-time basis. You must also be at least 21 years old here in the East Riding. There are no upper age limits. Our eldest foster carer is in their 80s at the moment, and I hear that they are amazing. What is important is to have the good health and enthusiasm to care for a child or a young person. There are no gender requirements either. You can be male or female or non-gender specific. The timescale for being an active foster carer of a child can range from one night to many years or until the child is an adult. You do not need to own your own home, but you'll need to have a spare bedroom. And the first step is to ask any resident who shows the slightest interest to contact East Riding Fostering Services. I have arranged for an email to land in your inbox this afternoon to give you all the necessary contact details. The team will arrange a visit to their home at a convenient time and help answer and guide through the understandable questions our residents will have. There will be comprehensive training, an allocated fostering social worker, an experienced foster carer buddy, foster carer support groups, and additional support for the children of foster carers and the opportunity to meet children from other foster families. And there's much, much more. Fostering is one of the most fulfilling jobs you can have because as a foster parent, you have the opportunity to shape and improve a young person's life. Many of our carers recall how their child was when they first arrived with them versus how they are now and can see marked improvements in the child's mood and happiness, which then in turn leads to a truly fulfilling and rewarding career. And yes, this can be a career for some. Fostering fees and allowances do not count as income tax or benefit purposes, therefore don't affect any benefit entitlement. Full-time foster carers may be able to claim a combination of working tax credits, job seekers allowance and or income support, plus other benefits, depending on their individual circumstances. Now I look around this room and there are 37 of us elected members and 26 wards. Just imagine the impact we would have if every ward had just one resident come forward as a potential foster carer. Councillor Aitken, I've given you the benefit of the extra 10 seconds. <laughs> if you wish us to have an extension. Um... I've literally got a paragraph and it's, it's my punchline, uh, Councillor Whitler. So I will ask. Uh, Councillor Aitken, you may have your punchline. So the life-changing effect that that would have on our children's lives, but also we have a responsibility to also manage our own budget and we could save many millions of East Riding pounds. You are all going to be out and about over the next year connecting with more of our residents. So remember to have a thought about who might be interested in becoming an East Riding foster carer. Thank you. And thank you for the time, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor. Again, uh, a punchline and not a hashtag in sight, I'm happy to say. We have 10 minutes allocated for the asking of questions of Councillor Aitken regarding her, the subject of her report. Uh, are there any takers on that? Yes, we have Councillor Gill. Yes, good afternoon. Yeah, uh, Please, can I ask, uh, you threw a few numbers at us there. Could I have clarification on the actual number of children in need of foster parents, you know, from volunteers, please? What I, what I suggest I do is actually if I send you out a copy of this, because I think it, I think it, there's quite a few figures in there. And I think that might be useful. Is that OK? Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Kiltish. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, would the portfolio holder agree that that while um, Sue Nicholson and Janet Gravel do a great job in developing our market strategy around fostering and, and getting the message out there for potential adopters, and um, that, that there's more we can do as councillors in, in sharing that, that message and, and trying to get some of our residents to come forward and, and do a bit as well. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Aitken. 
Yes, I, I absolutely agree. Thank you very much for that, Nick. And I, um, I mean, to be fair, that is my call. That's my call today. We have some amazing services, but we have some amazing kids that need some more, uh, some more support. And I think that the, our residents across the East Riding, that we have so many really very strong and positive families out there that maybe we're, we may be able to help and just lead, need to be just coaxed or nudged to actually ask those first difficult questions because it is quite challenging. I can imagine it being very daunting to be to putting your head above the parapet in that first instance. But thank you very much. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Councillor Aitken. Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, thank you, Chair. If I may, um, uh, are we okay? Wait until it gets to me. Go ahead, Councillor Wilkinson. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify, if I may. Um, that, that I heard you correctly, that um, the, the payments that uh, the foster people will get um, are, are not subject to causing problems for council tax support schemes and discretionary housing payments, etc. Councillor Aiken. Yep, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly, fairly comfortable to, to say yes. I haven't got the specific on that as a specific question, but I'm, fa I'm fairly confident and I will check for you, Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Councillor Atkinson. Councillor Boynton. Not working, yep. Uh, Councillor Aiken, um, first of all, we've I've had a number of contacts over recent weeks, so it's it's quite poignant, really. Um, firstly, the residents have, have seen uh, the council on Twitter, Facebook, advertising services of, of the foster service. Uh, both at Driffield Show and um, Holt Price Leisure Centre. However, unfortunately, they turned turned up to these events, and it's not uh, didn't appear confidential, shall we say? As in, there was a show tent there with lots of people walking about, um, so they decided not to approach the the team. Um, they in the email have said they then went to Holt Price Leisure Centre. Um, with the view that there may be a little side room that they could go into and, and speak to the team. Uh, again, it was in the lobby of uh, the lobby of the leisure centre. Again, people people passing. Uh, I mean, you, you have answered the question that that people can uh, have home visits there, but I think purely going from the Twitter, the Facebook that's getting pushed, it doesn't quite make that make that clear. Uh, and like I say, I've had two contacts over the past. Louise. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Boynton. Councillor Aiken. I really appreciate I appreciate that feedback, Councillor Boynton, because um just to assure members, um those those environments that you're ex that you're you're suggesting, they are publicity environments. They are never meant to be um private and confidential. And that is why basically all, all people need to do is just to get that contact even if it's just pick up the leaflet and then go onto the various websites or even onto the Facebook feeds because those they can Facebook message in and do it that way. But it's very, it is a confidential thing. I absolutely understand. And to be honest, that's why I brought it to Paul Council today because I know that we have some really capable and I think um, willing members of the public out there that would want to join and actually become part of the fostering family. It's just getting over that first hurdle and getting that confidence because it is, it's a daunting thing. It's a big responsibility and it's something that we need to get across. And I absolutely appreciate your comments, but be assured that those, those environments, Driffield Show is never going to be private, but at the same time, it's really positive to actually attend Driffield Show because it actually makes the profile of the service really, really much, much higher. But thank you for your comments. Thank you very much, Councillor Aitken. Any more questions of Councillor Aitken? No, right, deep breath, move on to notices of motion. To move, Councillor Everson, you have 10 minutes. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, right, well, this motion, I hope, will not be controversial and will have the support of Council to consider how we can help young people with careers advice. So just a little bit of context, uh, the Education Act 2011 states schools have a statutory duty to provide careers advice to all young people under 19. 
From 2001 to 2012, for those who remember it, that advice was delivered by the Connections Partnership. The 2011 Ed Education Act changed this plan and the duty to secure access to independent careers for students fell upon the secondary school. Definition being, teachers should be commissioners of advice, not providers. They should secure external careers guidance in addition to whatever a school provides internally. As already mentioned, that advice now comes from independent providers and the quality, I suppose, inevitably varies. And while some schools have to be, whilst all schools rather, have to be assessed by Ofsted on careers advice, I think it's fair to say it's not a primary focus. However, some schools make sure they're amazing career leaders and others perhaps not quite so good. This is a topic I feel very passionate about. Our economic landscape is improving all the time with a wealth and variety of job opportunities for young people. But we need to make sure they know about them. And I would suggest primary school is certainly not too early to start, although secondary is essential. There are a high quality of programs available, advice and link opportunities. Log on, move on is a really useful site. Although recent information suggests the youth parliament are not quite so impressed and are developing their own app. Everyone knows the route through to university. So why isn't the route to finding out about the variety of jobs on offer and the support that is available equally as clear? We need excellent engagement between schools and businesses. We need to enthuse our young people and provide them with all the information they need to help them make choices. Help them choose the right subjects to take. Help them with information on all the education paths if university isn't for them. Siemens are an excellent example of how companies get, get involved with schools. They're particularly active in the Ghoul area and make it easy for schools to engage with them. So I have just one or two requests here. If there's anything we can do as ward councillors to encourage a relationship between a business we know and a local school, and I include primary school, please do it. I know some of you already, you know, do get involved in this sort of activity. This council is one of the largest employers. Why can't we have ambassadors in each of our services? There must be so many contacts made on a regular basis with a variety of businesses. Encourage those businesses to contact local schools. Does this council have personal contact with schools to promote some of our job opportunities. And I stress the word personal, taking a leap out of the book of Siemens. Do we have any case studies of young people starting work at the council which could be used? Then the work of the youth parliament, who I believe are carrying out their own survey on how they would like to, to gather information and which of the local businesses are prepared to engage. We need to listen and give them support. With just a few changes, we really can make a big difference to the information our young people receive about job opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Everson. To second, we have Councillor Copsey. Thank you, Chair. I'm delighted that Councillor Everson has brought this motion to our attention at Council and I urge all councillors to support it. Log on, move it move on as uh, Councillor Everson mentioned an extremely useful career tool we should all take a look at it just simply put log on moving into a search and take a look see what it's about and spread the word to employers so with no further ado chair I beg to second the motion thank you Councillor Copsey Councillor Aitken thank you very much chairman and thank you Councillor Everson for putting the spotlight on this very important and positive area and it shows how directorates can work well together I welcome an opportunity to enhance and widen our school's already good working relationships with our economic region. As you all know, I have first-hand experience of seeing the incredible opportunities this region has, is being offered. And I absolutely want this council to be a conduit to partnership working to share aspiration for our youngsters and their families. I know our local schools are really excited and are on the journey with us already. And I'm sure they will want to grow those connections even further. 
East Riding is a great place to grow up and develop a great career locally. Members will recall the January 2022 CIPOS report on post-16 education and training, which highlighted the work already in place to support careers education and links to local businesses for both secondary and primary phase. Just to give you a flavor of the report, the work, work started in September last year, pulling together initiatives with Hull and East Yorkshire Careers Hub, which is run by the Careers Enterprise Company and set up by this government in 2015 in partnership with the Hull and East Yorkshire LEP. The Careers Hub brings together school staff, particularly careers leaders, and provides them with additional support, resources tra and training to enable the delivery of modern 21st century careers education within every, for everyone, no matter what their background or circumstances. The, the Careers Hub has expanded in the East Riding and now includes 16 out of the 18 of our secondary schools, one special school and two colleges. Every school and college is matched to an enterprise advisor who is a business volunteer and working alongside an enterprise coordinator supports the career leaders to develop a strong, sustainable and embedded career programme. We as a council also match fund an enterprise advisor role. The Career Hub has engaged the Cornerstone Employment Group, Employer Group. This is a group of employers who are committed to working with networks of schools and colleges to improve careers education, make sure skills, key skills for their sector are understood by teachers and education leaders inspire students, champion jobs in their local area and have a direct route into potential new employees living in, on their doorstep. Companies like Copernus, a local seafood leader, Cranswick Food, Country Foods, another huge local company from the national and international food sector. Weinerberger, the award-winning building materials and architectural development company. Keep Moat Homes, house builders. The Smile Foundation, working in the huge voluntary sector. BEA Systems, who deal in some of the world's most advanced engineering systems worldwide. And of course, Arco, another very local name and yet world leaders. The Career Hub offers a wealth of planned activities, which include virtual careers fair, the Humber Apprenticeship Showcase, the Virtual Festival of Skills program, online parenting sessions, and also facilitated sessions for students around making choices. Careers Links Governors Training and the sector specific information centers at sessions. So, in addition to these mainstream partnerships and to support our SEND schools, alternative providers, and to support our colleges, the Careers Hub facilitates a specialist group which meets regularly to provide more specialist support and collaboration for those youngsters with special needs. And of course, last but by no means least, in early years and primary phases of education, the East Riding Dogger Bank primary program was launched while I held Councillor Everson's ro role of economic development lead. The aim of the program is to promote the range of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics learning paths known as STEM subjects, which supports our children to understand the learning required for future careers available in our area. The Dogger Bank program launched when it was launched actually helped to provide a bit of a catalyst and as a result we have had uh, seen a number of other careers and STEM related organisations wishing to work with our primary schools on careers related activities. This work will I am sure help to inspire children to consider an education and training and a career in STEMs and finally I want to praise the work of Primary Futures who are a national group with a strong local cohort of inspirational volunteers from a range of careers who connect with our local schools to broaden horizons, challenge gender stereotypes and bring learning to life across the local authority area. And this is expanding. It's all about bringing careers education from an existing workforce into primary schools and support wider thinking of the art of the possible. There are lots of opportunities happening out there, and I am pleased to help raise the profile of the great work already initiated. Councillor Aitken, I regret to say you've exceeded I've your time three lines. again. <laughs> Would this be a punchline by any chance, Councillor Aitken? And to expand you... this by encouraging more local businesses to join these fantastic initiatives to give an even wider business base and encourage even more of our schools community. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Aitken. Councillor Steele. 
Thank you. That leads nicely into what I was going to say. <laughs> I welcome Councillor Everson's motion. Sharing with children from a young age the opportunities that could be available to them is something I'm very passionate about. Awareness can enthuse them and help them focus their studies to achieve their preferred career. Over the past few years, I personally have approached all the companies involved in the new developments <clears throat> and innovative developments in Southwest Holderness to consider engagement with the local schools and colleges. This has been welcomed by both the developers and the schools. A recent visit by representatives from Equinor in, to Inman's Primary School in Hedden was a great success for pupils, developers and teachers and much enjoyed by myself and fellow ward councillors. Equinor is one of the developments coming to Salt End that aims to contribute towards the decarbonisation programme, which is something that will very much feature in the future of these children. Prior to the visit, the developers infor had informed a scheme of work for the children, which really inspired them and led to some very challenging questions. One of the developers described the whole experience as the most fun day he'd had at work. The teachers described it as inspiring and left them on a real high and they are now sharing the scheme of work with other schools. So thank you again for the motion, which we'll definitely will be supporting. And it just shows that each one of us can make a little, a little impact on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Steele. Councillor Healy. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, well, I'll be supporting this motion as well. Um, but I just wanted to draw on a point that uh, Councillor Everson did make. She talked about uh, the, the connection service. Um, and back in the day, of course, the Connection Service was a very powerful body. It was a, a, a government information service. It provided guidance and support to young people. Um, and, and it also focused on skill shortages and disabilities and so on. And there was a Connection Centre in every, in, every, in every town, pretty much. I can still remember the branding of, of it. Um, it was created uh, by the Learning and Skills Act in, in 2000, by about the year 2000. I was actually part of an employee of the Learning and Skills Council at the time. That government at the time invested in education and it invested in careers advice. Everything has gone downhill since then. This government has not been committed to careers support. There is no coherent place that somebody can go for careers advice. And it is lamentable that that is the case. And it means, of course, that we do have to encourage businesses to engage. You do have to encourage schools to engage. And it's all very, very piecemeal. So the motion is necessary because the government's neglected careers advice and skills. And that's lamentable. I support the motion. It's a pity that that motion has to come because of the failures of this Conservative government. Thank you. Council, please. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Chair. Well, firstly, from my days at school, I'd like to say that the investment of this Conservative Council into apprenticeships and promoting apprenticeships has made them so much more widely available to people because I can't remember when I was at school now, about seven, eight, nine years ago. The most recent of people in here, I imagine, anyway, generally. And the idea of an apprenticeship, if you want to go for that, you're quite frowned upon, really. So, and I know the work of our teams, backed by this Conservative led Council, has really changed that. For our young people we talk about government investment and government investment in education and skills well if we as an area want to really unlock government investment in education and skills we need to embrace the government's leveling up agenda and deliver on devolution and things locally which we can unlock so much power and so much funding to deliver on that for our local people through that conservative government's leading manifesto promise which was endorsed by the public in 2019 thank you chair thank you councillor hammond I'm not really keen on going political, but needs must with the double drives, I suppose. Councillor Harold, are you going to deliver a political speech? Oh, no. Absolutely not. I mean, I could agree with um, Councillor Healy on this one. In 1985, when I left school, um, the Job Centre was a really good place to go and Connections was fabulous. Sadly, neither that or the size 10 dress I was wearing at the time is of any use in this uh, century so I'll move on what I was just going to highlight is the fact that you know this council I'll, I'll be supporting the motion it's a fantastic positive motion that really just pledges our continued um, input into this area um, Log on, move on is a fantastic site that is accessed widely by a lot of the schools and not only are we going into primary 
Chair, you don't need me to tell you the importance of getting that word in at our nursery schools. And I know locally we have nursery schools that do deliver that. They deliver they deliver STEM in a way that our young people and early years understand. So while some may want to live in a, um, a society where you're given it by government, actually, what I feel is better is that we give what we want our residents to have here in the East Riding, and that's relevant, bespoke, um, independent advice for all and as early as possible. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harold. A nice bit of East Riding centric comment, which is nice. Uh, there are no further speakers, so uh, may I call upon Councillor Everson to close the debate. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, just to say thank you for the support. It, my intention was to raise awareness just about the necessity to make sure our young people across the East Riding are aware of every job opportunity there is and that they are very varied and rich. So. You know, if you do know of any gaps in the area you represent in your wards, then by all means speak to me or whoever. But uh, let's make sure that we get the best advice out there possible and, and raise awareness. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Everson. I will now take the vote. All those in favour, please show. Thank you. Those against? Any abstentions? Thank you. That is carried. One day I shall learn how to press a button correctly. Notice a motion to move Councillor Healy. Thank you, Chair. Um, in referring to the comments made to the media by the former deputy leader, I really am only interested in how these comments relate to this council. I'm not really interested too much in the internal wranglings of the Conservative group itself. I'm really not interested in that. I'm not, no, seriously, and I'm not interested in his observations that, quote, a treachery and betrayal at Westminster is also prevalent in the East Riding group here. I'm not interested in that. I'm only mildly, I am only mildly, colleagues, intrigued by his very, by his very, very, by his very interesting observation, which quote, perhaps after decades of conservative control, that from next May, the face of the council could change significantly. And that, he says, is maybe just what the East Riding and its residents need, new faces, new ideas, new energy. I'm not interested in any of that. So, but what does concern me on a serious note here is that these issues must be distracting the ruling group from the business of running the council. But it's not for me to intrude upon private grief and local political meltdown. What I do want to mention and what our residents are concerned about are the alleged comments of senior officers, allegedly, that we are, quote, an unfunctioning council where staff are leaving in their thrones, quote, where a shortage of refuse lorry drivers means the supervisors have had to take the wheel, and where the closed door policy is backed with almost all key decisions taken by senior officers, not elected members. Now, a hark back to what we started today talking about, um, and uh, with regard to scrutiny, and I respect and accept the comments that the leader made earlier today, that the assur and the assurances he gave that those issues in relation to bullying will be looked at. And I've brought this motion today, well, it says for the leader to make a statement and for this to be referred to the relevant scrutiny committee. And you can take that as you will, you can pass that or not pass that. What I don't really mind, what I really mind about is that we are here discussing it and we are concerned about it. Now, you know, who am I? I mean, I'm just a mere opposition backbencher. I have no clout whatsoever. But you know, to me, this feels wrong. It feels uncomfortable. Things feel broken. Senior officers allegedly thinking that the council is dysfunctional. Former senior cabinet members thinking that change is needed. What on earth is going on here? I simply ask that as, a, as an ordinary you know, opposition council, but that's what residents are asking when they read this stuff in the papers from respected former members of this council what is going on it feels as though the council 
has been brought to its knees. And the book has to stop somewhere. For goodness sake, Councillor Owen, tell us how you're going to fix it within whatever time you have left. Thank you, Councillor Healy, for that interesting comment. Uh, Councillor Nolan to second. Thank you, Councillor Nolan. We have Councillor Owen. Thank you, Chair. I've got to be very brief, actually. And I, I suggest the media and others treat with caution uh, the unsubstantiated views of individuals. The recent peer review was undertaken, instigated by, B, by, my, by myself, to highlight any issues, particularly about Office of Member Relations. The action plan is well in progress, well scrutinised in public by the Overview Management and Scrutiny Committee, of which I think Councillor Healy is Vice Chairman. So at that point, that's all I wish to say, and I'd like to move to the vote. Thank you, Chairman. If you want to move to the vote, Councillor Owen, we need to make that particular motion. Sorry, I need to say that again. I need to. Do you wish to make a motion as that uh, you wish, wish to move to the vote? If that's what is necessary, then yes. We need a, a second that we move to the vote. Councilman. Yep, second. Seconded. Seconded. In that case, I'm sorry, we're moving to the vote straight away as per the Constitution. All those in favour of the notice of motion, show your hands, please, now. Thank you. Any against? Any abstentions? Thank you. That motion is lost. We move on. We move on to Councillor... Hammond, who has 10 minutes in which to educate us. Thank you, Chair. Don't worry, I will not be taking 10 minutes to address the Chamber on this. Although it's nice to move back to a motion that actually delivers something for our residents rather than just waste time. So thank you, Chair. Whilst not directly in these riding, I hope that, mem that all members will agree with myself and Councillor Paul West, who is seconding this motion, that it is in the best interests of our residents and our economy for our neighbours in York to secure Great British Rail and become its new home. York has made it to the final round of a potential six sites to be the new home of Great British Rail out of an original 42 applications. I feel we must do all we can to support York in their bid for this large, government organisation and all the investment, influence and employment opportunities to be brought to our region if they are successful in securing it. For as a close neighbour, we too, particularly in Walls Wheaton and Pocklington, will benefit from this as well. Our residents would gain access to jobs, skills building and hopefully additional transport investment, all fitting with a conservative levelling up agenda to improve the lives of people in northern areas like ours. Therefore, I propose that this council writes to the Secretary of State for Transport in support of York's bid to be the new home of Great British Rail, so that our region and residents can benefit from the government investment, and also that we encourage all residents to take part in the public vote, which is open until the 15th of August, on which sites should be the new home of Great British Rail. Thank you, Chair. So I move the motion as, read, as written in our papers. Thank you, Councillor Hammond. Uh, to be seconded by Councillor West P. Yes, completely agree with um, Councillor Hammond. Just to highlight that in our part of the East Riding, the rail industry plays a major part. The opportunity, opportunity that the new headquarters will give to our local residents for training and future careers is immense. And the investment that we've already seen by the East Riding and Siemens within the Goole area will complement this greatly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor West. Councillor Healy. Thank you, Chair. Well, I'm delighted that uh, Councillor Hammond has brought forward this motion, uh, very well thought through. Uh, I have no hesitation in supporting it. I do agree it moves things forward for our residents. In fact, 
I was so inspired when I read Councillor Hammond's well-chosen words uh, this week that I immediately logged in and cast my vote. I don't know how many of you have done it, but it's not difficult to do. You just go online and you can cast your vote. There's various other towns in it in the pictures, well, including some in Yorkshire, like Doncaster and Sheffield, I think. Um, but I think that York's unique rail heritage and its existing connectivity and its highly skilled workforce make the city a great fit to be at the heart of the country's rail industry. This is the organisation that will run the railways in the future. It's going to be as famous as British Rail ever was. And I think that with this excellent forward thinking council, York, York City Council, also has the ambition to make the most of this move. The council in York and its partners have put together a very strong bid. They've attracted, I think they've secured £155 million in funding. Uh, which includes two and a half thousand new homes and around six and a half thousand new jobs yeah. expected. And that's going to give the uh, huge boost to the local economy. I'm also delighted that the York bid has received the public backing of Sir Ed Davey, no less, leader of the Liberal Democrats, who on a recent visit to the city said, quote, I would urge people to join me in backing York's bid and bringing Great British Rail home. I think it's a great opportunity to host the new public body and we'll run the nail work in the future. And so I'm very pleased that Councillor Hammond has responded positively to the leader of York City Council, Councillor Aston, who has asked for fellow leaders, councils, partners and residents to support the bid by bringing this sort of thing forward to their councils for discussion. Thank you, Councillor Hammond. I appreciate it. I am backing this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for those kind words, Councillor Healy. Uh, there being no other speakers, I uh, will call upon Councillor Hammond to close the debate. Thank you, Chair. Just to say, I hope members support the motion and the levelling agenda put forward by this government. Thank you. Just couldn't help yourself, could you, Councillor Hammond? <laughs> I will now take the vote. All those in favour, please show. Those against? Abstentions? Thank you, that vote is carried. Right, after we've had this particular motion with your agreement, Council, I'll suggest that we have a five minute adjournment after this motion, if you're good. Um, that is because it is getting rather warm in here and also uh, one may need a comfort break myself included so to move councillor nolan you have 10 minutes yeah i'll read the motion out for those on youtube the council recognizes the importance of library services and resolves that there'll be no reduction in library services when carrying out its review of library services in 2023 now members will be aware that the cmt budget uh, they proposed had in that in 2023 they would review library services with a view to seeking savings or cuts. There was some reference to trying to share with other services like customer service centres. There's references some, in some cases to libraries being given over to volunteers. Now that was clearly there. Members will also be aware that previous review in 2017 cut library opening hours substantially, particularly in the smaller uh, village libraries. They were particularly badly hit. So clearly any further cuts to service would effectively close those libraries. Now, the Conservative budget for 2023, so 2022 to 2023, only covers parts of 2023. It's a one year budget. So the amendment that's put in here is economically illiterate because the review was always gonna be next year. And so we don't actually know what's gonna happen next year. Now, I did ask the officer responsible, I'm not gonna name him, um, but it's the Director of Culture and Customer Services. And I said, you know, is there a review taking place or not? And I got back a, a statement that says, I can only reiterate that there are financial challenges ahead for which opportunities and options are yet to be determined across culture and customer services. I'm not involved in specific or targeted review this time and cannot yet fully determine where opportunities for savings will be found for years to come. So I then wrote a simple question. Are you saying the review is not taking place or that, or that it is, but hasn't yet been scoped? Is it the former or the latter? And the reply I got is, I'm sorry you feel I haven't answered your question, <laughs> although I am of the opinion that I have answered it fully and comprehensively to the best of my knowledge. 
So there we have it, uh, clear as mud, uh, not very clear at all as to what's going on in library services. So I've put this motion down, hoping that members will back it, send out a clear message that there'll be no reduction in library services, whether the review takes place in 2023 or later, um, on the basis that I think we need to let, let residents know where this council stands. I think the amendment, as I say, is illiterate because it only deals with a one year period, doesn't deal with the rest of 2023. So our group will not be supporting the amendment. Uh, we will be pushing for the resolution that we put forward. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Councillor Nolan. To second, Councillor Corliss. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to second this very briefly. It's particularly relevant to my ward uh, because of the age profile of the residents, really. Most of the usage of the libraries is by the elderly and the other section that leaves it a lot to the very young preschool reading groups and so on. So it it forms, uh, the library gives an important social service. It has, it has a real social value and it should not just be about cost cutting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Corliss. An amendment has been submitted by Councillor Bedini to move Councillor Bedini. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to thank the Lib Dems for their motion, even though everything about it is wrong. Just to give some context behind the original motion that is before us today, because there is a campaign called Save the Library Campaign out in Swanland. A campaign which is unnecessary, and the only reason for this is to mislead residents. The reason, of, the reason it is unnecessary is explained in the amendment, which I will read out for the benefit of the residents watching online, as I assume some of the people who have signed the Save the Library petition will be eager to see what happens today. Here is the amendment. That this council recognises the importance of libraries and the social benefit to our communities, and acknowledges that there will be no reduction in library services as part of an original suggested CMT review in 2023, as this council's recent conservative budget removed the proposed library review for 2023. We also continue to develop whilst taking opportunities to deliver new agile commercial and digital, digital initiatives to meet residents' expectations and needs. And also I'd take this opportunity to commend our library and customer service staff for the frontline work that they deliver for our residents. Now, when this library review was first suggested in the draft CMT budget papers, no one leading this Save the Library campaign got in touch with me as portfolio holder. And I'm here for everybody, you know, and I've said that numerous times. I'm not just here for people in this group, I'm here for every elected member of this council. Now, the first person to get in touch with me was Councillor Abraham. And we worked together as a group and we made the necessary changes in our conservative budget. And I don't recall anyone or group who opposed our conservative budget to come up with plans of anything of their own to save the libraries. In fact, nobody from the group proposing this original motion has spoke to me about this ever, not, not at all, since, since I've become portfolio holder. And the only reason for this campaign and motion is to spark fear and pretend they are doing something. They might think it's okay to do this, but the knock-on effect is not very nice. Our libraries and staff work with a vast range of residents and some of, our, some of the individuals may be living alone and who will have limited personal interactions during any given day or week. And I've seen firsthand the great work our staff provide and how appreciative our residents are for this personal touch, which is more than just giving books, you know, they're there to just see to their needs really. So please don't tell everyone that the service is just going to grab a headline. If you don't know what's going on, you can always ring somebody who does. And, and you was actually lucky to get a reply from the director of customer services because he's actually on annual leave. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Medini. To second, Councillor Abraham. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I'm delighted to second Councillor Medini's amendment and to recognise the good news that residents in smaller communities such as North Ferriby and Swanland will not see a reduction in their library provision. Members will recall that I raised this issue at full council in February in a question to the leader. And Councillor Medini pledged his support to me then to maintain the 10 small village libraries in the East Riding. So here we have confirmation again from the portfolio holder that there will be no closure of branch libraries. And one wonders why the motion is even here today. Could it be that the Lib Dems may once again be spinning the untruth 
that the closure of branch libraries was in the Conservative budget proposals. We all know that when we receive the budget papers, we are reading the officers' propo uh, proposals. An experienced politician, such as the op opposition group leader, would of course know that, or at least I hope he would. But never missing the opportunity for a headline, in a recent by-election leaflet in my ward, we get library plans make for hard reading. Village libraries, including Swan and North Ferriby, could face the act under plans from County Hall Conservatives, and they are looking at acting them all together. Oh, and sign our petition to save our libraries. Those statements were all in a leaflet promoted by the Lib Dem leader on behalf of his candidate. The Lib Dems really should know better than to issue misleading and untrue statements to the public. Our public deserves far better. They don't need to be conned into signing a petition that is unnecessary and which will have no impact. It is also distressing for our library staff to be reading of this uncertainty. But I expect we will soon read how they claim they saved the day for the library in one community not too far from here. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Abraham. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Chair. I think we all agree here that our libraries are much more than just book collection points. They are community hubs, which all residents, not just the elderly, have absolute need to access and use, and I'm sure do. I know they do in Market Wheaton in my ward. I think, as councillors have said, the portfolio holder, Councillor Abraham, the Conservatives in County Hall here in Beverly have pledged to protect these libraries time and time again and continue to do so. Funnily enough, when other local authorities were cutting library services, this Conservative-led authority kept them going. That's why they still exist. And we will continue to do so. In fact, we pledged that in our Brilliant North by-election campaign literature repeatedly. And unlike others, we don't make promises we can't keep. I sometimes feel we've had quite a bit of political debate, but uh, Councillor Nolan. I was going to close the debate at the point, but... Um, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, in that case, um, we'll, go first. we'll bring in Councillor Wicks. Yeah, thank you. It's sad, isn't it, when members feel the need to whip up fear amongst communities in order to give them an, an edge at an election. If you spend time in our libraries, what you see are some fantastic staff who, in many ways, go above and beyond the call of duty to provide for, um, for the local communities and for the people that use the services. And I think it's really upsetting that when you see statements in leaflets about how the Conservatives want to close libraries or that we're not standing up for libraries, when it's simply not the case, and I often think about how that affects the people that are working there. You know, we ha we've had discussions already about how staff are apparently leaving in their droves. And we know from conversations that we've had on scrutiny that there is a problem amongst our staff's well-being. We've had so many conversations around the social work um, work workforce well-being. Um, and I imagine that a lot of the concerns that the staff feel there extend um, to other areas of the council too. So when people or, or elected members in, in positions of authority start spreading messages that simply aren't true, all it does is upset people that are out there day in, day out, working hard. So I'd ask, and I'm asking a rhetorical question, do you not feel bad when you sit there on your computer writing a, a leaflet that you know is false that you know is going to cause unprecedented harm and upset to the people working in our libraries? Do you not care? Because we do. We know the truth. We'll continue to stand up for the truth. And if you want to continue to peddle untruths, then go for it. But we, we will continue to say what's actually happening. Thank you, Councillor Weeks. Councillor Meredith. Thank you, Chairman. I'll be brief. An insert. <laughs> you have five minutes, Councillor Meredith. There is a purpose to my brevity, Chairman. Um, in so doing, I'll be able to give this motion the attention it deserves. Unlike many others, this council has always and consistently protected libraries to the best of its ability. 
Fiscal constraints are a reality, and this has seen libraries across the land close, but not here. We have to work within our means, and sadly, infinite wants cannot be met by finite resources. Reduced hours was quite simply the cost of protecting and preserving the service as a whole. It is not possible to reopen a closed library when the building is no longer the property of the authority. But this authority has not closed any libraries. All are still open and all can be reinstated to their former glory as funds permit. This was reinforced in the Conservative budget, the most recent one, and it was not mentioned by any other group which makes me think there must be an ulterior motive to the motion before us. Otherwise, if a priority is a priority, it would have been consistently voiced. As a result of that, I would say that the, uh, the Conservative budget has protected and supported libraries, as has our consistent philosophy. So what I would like to do is pass along two messages to my colleagues, ironically sat to my right. First off, come on, keep up. Secondly, you can stick that in a leaflet. Although the truth might seem incongruous next to planning related fabrications, health related fallacies and campaigns designed to stoke fears. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Meredith. Right, Councillor Medini has the right to uh, close, uh, has the right to reply uh, before Councillor Nolan actually closes the debate. Oh, I've got Councillor Pallon up there now. You were a bit late pressing your button there, Councillor Button. Nearly missed you out. Good chair. I'd just like to make a note in reference to libraries. Hazel Library doesn't open on a Wednesday. We didn't know why. Bridlington doesn't open Monday and Wednesday. Uh, Bruff doesn't open Monday and Tuesday. And that is Driffield Monday and Tuesday. So we're not closing libraries. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pradden. Councillors, would you mind? allowing Councillor Medini to speak to close uh, his right of reply before Councillor Nolan actually closes the debate. Councillor Medini, you have the floor. Thanks, Chair. Just to Councillor Padden there, them libraries are still open, and had it been any other authority, the, the, yeah, the, the still services being provided from them buildings, had it been any other authority, they, they, they might have just closed permanently, but we, we, you know, we've maintained a decent level of service there. Now, I want to touch on what Councillor Weeks mentioned about the staff. As portfolio, I've had a few members of staff message me about this so-called Save the Library campaign, and it doesn't go down too well. And only a few questions and motions ago, we have the Lib Dems talking about staff welfare and bullying and stuff like that. And what, 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 do, what do they see when they see all this crap you're peddling? It doesn't look good, does it? Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your well honed argument, Councillor Medini. Uh, Councillor Nolan, would you like to close the debate? Thank you, Chair. I will be brief. Um, there was a lot there about the Lib Dems and worried about the Lib Dems and all the rest of it. And, uh, and at one point, uh, Brid North was mentioned. And uh, I'm sure Councillor Hammond thinks he fought a good campaign in Brid North. We, we're happy to him to carry on doing the same thing because let's face it, it was a disaster for them. There was also reference to uh, residents and, and, and all the rest of it. I have to say that residents feel extremely let down over what happened with Amazon. They're extremely upset about what happened with Gladman. So the record of, of some of the Conservatives has not been very good in terms of looking after residents. Councillors, please. So I would say residents are not stupid. And uh, I'll, I'll move back to libraries. Hang on a sec, Councillor Nolan. We have a point of order raised. Who would raise a point of order? Would you care to stand up and express what yeah. part of the Constitution you wish well, to raise your point of order on? Amazon may sell books, but they're nothing to do with our library service. So. <laughs> Yes, perhaps Councillor Nolan could uh, continue. Okay, uh, thank you, and thank I would you. appreciate it if you would stick to the actual debate. Yes, I'm that. happy to do that, Chair. Thank you. I think the, the reference to protecting libraries, that's not what, I mean, Viv mentioned Hesel being shot on a Wednesday and it's shot on a half-day Saturday. We've got problems in Swan and the North Ferriby where the libraries are only open effectively two whole days because they're scattered over half days. That's not protecting libraries. And when there is a reference to a, a review of libraries, in 2023, we're not there yet. Residents, quite rightly, are concerned about what's going to happen to the libraries. We, we've picked up that concern. We've amplified that concern. That is perfectly reasonable. That's what we're here for. We're here to communicate with residents, inform them what's going on. Now, we don't want to see our libraries cut. You probably don't either. But what we're saying today is pledge that. 
in other words, agree with what we're putting down here, which is that there'll be no reduction in library services whenever the review takes place. That's what we're saying. Now, if you can't go with that, you're coming in with something for a one-year deal, we can't support that. So we will stick with the motion as printed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Nerland. Uh, we will take the vote on the amendment first. All those in favour of the amendment, please show. Thank you. And those against? Thank you. In that, in that case, the amendment now becomes a substantive vote. So all those in favour of the amendment and the substantive vote, please show. Those against? Any abstentions? Thank you, Councillor Medini's. Right, councillors, uh, I did offer you the, uh, the opportunity of a five minute break. I think I'll still let you.
you'd like to take your seats, ladies and gentlemen, councillors. We shall be reconvening in 30 seconds. Right, thank you, councillors. I trust you enjoyed your short break, and we'll move on to a notice of motion from Councillor Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the motion is brief, I'll be brief. Uh, we need to stop supplying single use plastic cups because they're bad. As we seek to, do, to lead this community, in accepting that changes in behavior are necessary to address the climate emergency. This motion highlights not that those steps need to be big, nor that they be small, but they do need to be taken. So Mr. Chairman, I commend this motion to council. Thank you, Councillor Walker, to be seconded by Councillor Norman. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I wish to second this motion and doing so hope that it once again highlights that this council is serious about the climate emergency. I understand this council also needs to be seen to be managing its finances to the full benefit of the community. So whilst there may be stocks of plastic beakers in our stores, we should continue to use them, but we should identify and publicize environmental ways for them to be reused, such as donating them to allotments to grow seedlings or to schools to enable them to grow small saplings which will kind of enhance the environment in the future so in conclusion mr chairman i beg to second this simple motion but feel the time scale that is suggested in the amendment will not be accepted by residents although we will accept it this time thank you thank you councillor norman uh, we have councillor jefferson Yeah, that's better. That's better. Oh, I want you to hear me. Um, I've been quiet all day. There's been a lot of hot air. I've been quiet. I just want to say I think this is a really, really good motion. However, what I would like him to do, Councillor Walker and Councillor Norman, is to add that we as councillors can have cups and saucers back so that when we are having a cup of tea or coffee, they can then can drink it and then it can go in a dishwasher because all these cartons and things out there are what you drink out of in the street, not here amongst people and amongst colleagues. I just wish we could do that. Just think of that there's no waste. It's going straight through the dishwasher. It comes out clean and then we can have a cup of tea in a cup and saucer, please. Thank you. I hope you agree with me. Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. Uh, an amendment uh, has been submitted by Councillor Matthews. Councillor Matthews. Yeah, I'm just seeking clarity, Chairman, whether uh, my amendment is being accepted by uh, Councillor Walker and Councillor Norman. He's stuck his thumb up and he's, I think he's accepted the amendment. Um, the reason for putting the amendment was to make it a, a smart objective. It's time bound, it's relevant, it's achievable, it's measurable, and it's specific. So in saying that, Chairman, I fully support the motion to stop supplying single cup use. The only issue I have now is how many single use plastic cups do we have in stock? And that's the reason for my motion, amended motion. Uh, I certainly don't want it to be go to waste. We might as well use them while we have them. The other issue, of course, is that we need to find alternatives. And I'm pleased to inform you, Chairman, that 
our offices are already looking at uh, alternatives. I think both Beverly and Holton Price Leisure Centre are actually trying uh, veggie, what do they call them? Veggie materials, the, the form of plastic made out of vegetable matter to use, as, to use cups. Uh, but at the end of the day, it would be more sustainable to use these rather than these, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you for the show and tell, Councillor Matthews. Uh, Councillor Barrios, to second. Oh, sorry. No, it says Councillor Meredith here. Thank you, Chairman. Honestly, I was expecting a bit longer before I got the opportunity yeah. to speak. Uh, I'd just like to say that I actually am quite quite glad to be able to second this amendment. It allows me to address three people and well, four people actually in three points. Uh, to Councillors Walker and Norman, I think it's a very sensible motion to bring forward. To Councillor Matthews, I think every uh, every addition you put forward only enhances it, and it makes us not only sustainable but sensible. And to Councillor Jefferson, as much as I would love to endorse your desire to see porcelain used, I'm afraid I'm somewhat of a butterfingers. And uh, it would be a tragedy, not only to stain the carpet, but also to see that sort of thing broken. So uh, what, what I'd say there is in the ethos of waste not, want not, can I ask that all the uh, cups that we do use in future are not only uh, sustainable, but also solid. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Meredith. I will now, there being no other speakers, um, oh, hang on, Councillor Matthews, you have the right of reply before Councillor Walker closes the debate. Do you wish to reply, Councillor Matthews? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure we, we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. And there is a saying, Chairman, look after the pennies and the pounds will look after themselves. I think with the scale of things, it's probably looking after the farthings and they look after the pounds. But nevertheless, this is something that we really need to move forward. And I hope everybody will support the motion with the added amendment. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Matthews. Perhaps we ought to explain what a farthing is. But, um, you know. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Matthews. Uh, Councillor Walker, you wish to conclude the debate. Hi, thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes, we happily accept that amendment. Uh, but even though we may uh, use stocks up until the 31st of uh, December, it doesn't mean that we have to take them and use them and throw them away, does it? There are better uses. The supply of single-use plastic cups is something that we know to be wrong. They're harmful and entirely avoidable. We just need to stop doing it. So thank you very much for your amendment. Thank you very much. I hope you'll support this motion. Thank you, Councillor Walker. We'll take the vote on the amendment first. All those in favour, please show. Any against? Any abstentions? Right, that is carried. So the amendment becomes a substantive motion upon which you shall be voting again. All those in favour? Those against? Abstentions? Thank you very much for a well-reasoned debate. I enjoyed that one. And we move on to Councillor Nolan. You have 10 minutes, Councillor. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to read this motion out. I know it's quite long, but I think for the benefit of anybody on YouTube, uh, I think we need to explain what we're talking about. So the motion is that uh, Council notes that many of our residents are struggling with the cost of living. On the 1st of April 2022, Ofgem increased the energy price cap by 54%. In the light of the increased energy price cap, the average standard tariff energy bill will increase by £693 per year. The average prepay meter energy bill will increase by £708 per year. In 2021-22, in the East Riding area, food banks distributed 10,034 food parcels, of which 5,276 were for children, 4,758 for adults. This, sadly, has risen sharply from a total of 3,500 parcels in the year to March 2019. And here I'm quoting the Trussell Trust. So this council therefore declares a cost of living emergency and calls on the government 
to immediately reduce the standard rate of VAT from 20% to 17.5% for one year, saving the average household in these riding a further £600 this year, and immediately restores the universal credit supplement of £20, which was cancelled by the government in September 2021. This council instructs the chief executive to write to the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions to express the council's demands for VAT to be cut to 17.5%, and for the £20 universal credit supplement to be restored. Finally, and importantly, this council calls for a local, local cost of living emergency summit with stakeholders, including citizens advice, food banks, local trade unions and chambers of commerce and inviting local MPs to attend this hybrid meeting. So that chair is, is the motion we're putting today. Um, now I have seen references to uh, leveling up and all the rest of it, but it's clear that a leading think tank IPPR North is saying public spending uh, in the North since 2019 has remained lower and has grown less than in other parts of the country. So we're not levelling up, we're, we're slipping backwards in the East Riding. And this has been recognised by the Yorkshire Post, which said you know, three years after Boris Johnson vowed levelling up is a failed policy. The Yorkshire Post has had the lamentable duty of frequently de detailing how the government's so-called levelling up agenda has been an abject failure. And I noticed the other day in the whole Daily Mail, similar message that the North is being ignored. <laughs> um, the, the North is being, is, is being ignored and all this talk about levelling up is a load of nonsense. I am concerned, Chair, because local people are undergoing misery as inflation approaches double digits. With inflation hitting double figures, the real value of our residents' wages or pensions are being eroded. Meanwhile, the Conservatives are turning inwards and having a leadership election. They don't care about residents. So we've got this motion before us. I see there is an amendment there. Most of it I, I welcome. I, I think the fact that you, the Conservatives are agreeing that there's a cost of living emergency is positive. I think also back in the cut in VAT 17.5% and the universal and bringing back the universal credit supplement is positive. Those things will put money back into people's pockets now. I do have a concern that the amendment deletes the local cost of living emergency summit. Um, I don't have a problem with the rest of it, but for that reason, we will not be supporting the amendment uh, as it's printed, because we believe that the local cost of living emergency summit is important. And therefore, uh, on that basis, I'll be moving motion as printed and welcome support from Council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nolan. I call upon uh, Councillor Johnson to second. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, if you remember um, the and finally, of the news at 10 a few years ago with Trevor McDonald. Well, the important thing about this motion is the and finally bit, the summit of all the stakeholders, not just the members of a wellbeing board from which most of us are excluded, but it's in a summit which includes the majority of those who are suffering from the cost of living rise. And it's only gonna get worse. Wholesale gas prices today went up another 9% which will make the projected £3,244 energy cap in October definitely going to increase. And it's not only the impact on mental health, which will be the upshot of dealing with this cost of living increase, which is due to a whole variety of reasons, but it will cause physical health difficulties, especially for the very young and the very old. And by definition, the most vulnerable are those who are represented by those who know them best, not by people who sit on boards. I would like to remind everybody here of what happened during COVID. The response to COVID was by the grassroots. How many of us got together and, and helped our, our neighbours who couldn't get out to the shops? Do you remember those red and green notices that we had in windows? Do you remember sewing scrubs? Do you remember the food banks that were set up and people contributed? Well, that's what's going to happen again with this cost of living rise. In the same way as COVID brought the community together, it's the grassroots who are going to have to come together and help with the cost of living rise. The sort of people who helped with COVID and the sort of people who will be helping our neighbours with their cost of living issues are not the kind of people who sit on a board that they are the kind of people who would come along to a summit, who would say what they think and say what they feel, 
and would give a true representation of how we can help our fellow man with this cost of living crisis. And that's the crux of our motion. And that's why we are so disappointed to see the amendment by the Tories. Thank you. We have uh, an amendment which has been submitted by Councillor Owen. Councillor Owen. Yeah, that, thanks very much, Chairman. And you're a bit late to the party, I think, on this. We've had this issue about cost of living crisis coming for weeks, if not months now. We've seen it coming. Everybody's seen it coming. I take offence that we in this, as board members or whatever, don't appreciate what's happening in the real world. I know uh, many of our colleague members in our group are involved daily in food banks and other things. And uh, so please don't think we're distanced. Uh, I, I just think it's another publicity campaign calling for a, a cost of living summit. There are bodies already working on this. I have a list of things I'll, I'll touch on of what we're actually already doing as a local authority. But I'm, I'm going to. But the nice thing about not a, accepting is is the our our amendment is that I have the chance to sum up a bit at the end of of our uh, amendment rather than having to incorporate into yours. So at this point, I'm not going to say any more at this point because I know my deputy has very strong views on this and uh, I'm more than happy to allow her to speak and I will have the opportunity later to sum up because I'm sure others are as well. But it, it, it's just, I will say that my amendment or our amendment was very much to say that we are on the case, we are putting money aside and we do have the right forums to bring all those people together in a constructive fashion rather than just a one day attention seating news headline. Thank you, Councillor Owen. To second, Councillor Handley. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to second this amendment and I also reserve the right to speak, please. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Handley. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Chair. Um, for me, this motion from the Liberal Democrats is just their usual style of all talk and no action. It doesn't go far enough for me. Councillor Johnson talks about the grassroots leading on this. So why is your plan to address this cost cost of living emergency to just lobby the government who is already actively working to help people with this issue not actually as the sick for richest local authority to come up with our own plan locally to address this issue which the conservative amendment which councillor johnson says she, she doesn't agree with shows that we as the conservatives leading this council want to do that we're not just going to go and moan to government and beg for help we're going to get on with it and do it ourselves and deliver for our local residents as we always do so that's why I'll be supporting the amendment and not the Lib Dem motion, which actually shows no action to address this serious issue, except for just to ask the government for help. And they're already doing that. On Councillor Nolan's point about levelling up, well, levelling up is not a failure. Go to Teesside, go to West Yorkshire, South Yorkshire, Greater Manchester, the areas that have got levelling up properly because they've embraced evolution and got that key to unlock the benefits of levelling up. Levelling up is a brilliant success in those areas shown by the fact that people like Ben Houchin continue to get increased majorities in elections that the people are getting involved but to embrace leveling up we need to embrace devolution so that's the only reason why we are slightly behind but we are on with that we're working towards that so perhaps you could tell your colleagues in Hull to also work towards that with us thank you thank you Councillor Hammond Councillor Elvidge I wasn't intended to speak today but it's quite interesting when you study the original motion that there is a slight lack of understanding in some areas of this council and what the VCSE network is, where the citizens advice, debt advice groups, along with food banks and relevant charities who have been meeting for years together and have been working together for years to help our residents. It's almost insulting to say they're going to come together. We've been doing this for years. And I think once in a number of years, I've seen one member of your group attend that meeting. I was quite shocked that they actually knew what it was, but disappointed. That's why I'll be supporting the amendment. Thank you, Councillor Elvidge. Do you want to come back yet, Councillor Handy, or shall we move on through the list? Yep, of course you can. Councillor Marius. Can I, can I come back now, oh. um, Chair? Feel free. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, Mr Chairman, I am somewhat shocked that Councillor Nolan is not aware of what this Conservative Council has been doing to support its residents before 
during and post pandemic. So please allow me to enlighten him. This Conservative Council has distributed emergency food funds up from August 2020 to the tune of £342,000. Emergency Assistant Fund, £148,000, £704. Council Tax Hardship Payments, £1,900,000. £31,424. Covid Local Support Fund for Food and Energy, £942,701. The Household Support Fund, £1,983,004. The Energy Rebate, £17,400,000. 84,300 pounds of which we have now paid 92.92% with money that we've received from this conservative government. We have a number of food banks and social supermarkets across the East Riding made up mostly of volunteers, some who are in this room now, who are helping the most vulnerable in our society, the working poor and people on benefits. The majority of the, the operational funding for these has come from this council. Councillor Nolan, I could go on, but you get the point. This Conservative council has looked after its residents and I'm sure you will agree. All this while still having, still having managed to deliver over 600 services. As the leader alluded to earlier, this Conservative Council has set aside £4.4 million What's the point of to order? help Councillor our Hand residents. Councillor Handling, there's been a point of order raised. Sorry. Councillor Walker. Thank you for your clarification, Councillor Walker. Uh, Councillor Handley, before you can recommence, uh, may I advise that uh, it is usual for councillors to address each other through the chair and not directly? Sorry, Chair. Thank you. Um, chair, I apologise to Councillor Walker. It's a Conservative run council. This council owes a great thanks to the staff who have all worked and continue to work to make our East Riding residents get all the help and support that they are entitled to. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hanley. Councillor Holmes. Thank you, Chair. Um, you'll be pleased to know that I'm not going to mention party politics once. I'm delighted um, to hear it, Councillor Holmes. I, I, I wanted, I wanted to highlight what Councillor Owen, the leader, had said about the difference between actual help on the ground and a headline. And that's why this amendment is important. Because to call for a summit, a large meeting of people where councillors can stand there and say, look at what we're doing to help, will not in reality help people. It will only be done as a vanity project to enhance your own profiles. Real help needs to be local, it needs to be targeted, and that's best done quietly because the kind of barriers that are in place between us and the people that we all want to help are barriers like one, people are embarrassed to ask for help and they're embarrassed to take help. And so having a big fancy summit, people won't want to be seen going to that. Having one big summit in a big place won't help people who don't want to incur the cost of travelling that geographical distance. And what's really disappointing about the fact that this motion is before this council today is that in March, I spoke about things that were happening in my ward Things happening quietly where grassroots groups 
had got together, together with officers from this council who had given their time to come and sit in community health centres and advise people on their benefits and advise people how they could make the most of their income and minimise their outgoings. And I said, if you build it, they will come. This is something you can do within your own wards. If you build it, they will come. And yet we have a motion here calling for a summit that would only be a headline. What's happened in my ward in that time, quietly, without announcement until now, and it wouldn't have been mentioned unless of this motion, is that we've had another. We had one on the 14th of July. Didn't need a headline, didn't need big publicity, but did it help people? Yes, it really did. Thank you, Councillor Holmes. Councillor Meredith. Thank you, Chairman. And I have prepared a few words for today, but firstly, and with apologies to both yourself and Councillor Walker, I would just like to be the first one here to congratulate and wish luck to Councillor Nolan on his future general election campaign. His national focus dialogue today leads me to believe there is confusion about which chamber is in. Parliament's that way, Councillor Nolan. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Dell. The point is taken. Councillor Meredith, you're in danger of becoming a little overexcited. That is fair, on. and I do apologise, Chairman. I merely wanted to point out we are here today to deal with local issues, not attention issues. And with that in mind, I'm actually quite supportive of the principles, ambition and philosophy behind the motion we see before us, especially as I actually consider it to be quite conservative in nature. So there may be hope yet. Um, you know, I felt that the need to comment here, though, because the motion has similarities with a telescope. It provides a lens to focus in on a significant issue, but it misses the bigger picture. This is combined with some inaccuracies which uh, motivated what follows. So I'll start with the £20 universal credit supplements. This was in place for a purpose. That purpose was COVID. It was not cancelled, as the motion suggests. It was completed. Now, as the cost of living rises, I'm happy to support calls for another universal credit supplement, but to call for a reinstatement is to show naivety, or perhaps even something more nefarious, an attempt to mislead and manipulate. Similarly, I'd be happy to add my voice to a chorus calling for a reduction of VAT, although I'd advise that you don't ask me to sing. Now, sadly, I don't think this motion does enough, and we've heard a great deal why already. I think Councillor Holmes really hit the nail on the head about what does matter. It certainly does nothing to uh, recognise the great deal of work already underway. And I'd like to thank Councillor Handley for coming in ahead of me and detailing this so clearly and so eloquently. So to return to my earlier metaphor, it is this work, the work that has already been detailed, that is the vast night sky. This motion is the telescope. It has allowed us to see this clearly, but it will do very little to move us forward. It will help provide assurance to the public, but not to councillors who quite frankly should be well informed if they've been paying any attention. And I don't mean here in the chamber today, but at the multiple committees, the places where the hard and the detail orientated real work and preparation takes place, as described perfectly by Councillor Elvidge. You see members, this chamber allows us to tell a story, to set a narrative and to highlight or add, work, add weight to work that is already well underway. So for the avoidance of doubt, Mr. Chairman, let me tell you and all the other members here what the real story is here, that there are some who want to be seen as fighting for the people and that they want to show you um, that they care. But what they really show you is that they're ill-informed. They're not here working for the people, they're working for themselves. An irony abounds that they can talk about food on the table when they're quite frankly all sizzle and no steak. So let me make it clear. There are councillors at this authority who consider the well-being of residents our highest priority, who work hard day in and day out, not just when the cameras are on, and to residents who are struggling, I really want you to know that there is help available, that there are um, preparations already made to provide assistance, that that is the purpose of the councillors here. Please, please do reach out to us. I hear every week of somebody calling on behalf of a neighbour who didn't want to bother anybody. Now, that's just not right. What we need to be doing is all working together to encourage communication. And there are a great deal of councillors and officers at this council that you can call, email, hell, send a carrier pigeon to us, and we will do what we can to support you. Because at the end of the day, public servants is literally our job description. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Meredith. 
I regret to say, Councillor Hammond, you've already spoken once in this debate, so uh, I cannot allow you to return. Sorry about that. Uh, Councillor Bayram C. Oh, thank you, thank you. Well, oh, God. I'm okay, I'm okay. Uh, will you excuse me, both my ears are blocked up, so I can't hear a word that anybody's been saying. I'm using lip reading and ESP, so to get, to get the, my information. But the main difference between the amendment and the motion is the word summit. Well, a summit gives the expression of something very expensive. Uh, but I do feel that to have <clears throat> some form of conference uh, of some nature, maybe to slim it down the word summit, but, but to have a conference to get an idea from different people. One of the sections is the, the electricity suppliers. I mean, I was at a conference with, with uh, one time with the person from Drax who sells the electricity. He says the electricity produced on the offshore wind turbines, if they didn't get a penny for it, they'd still make a good big profit because they get double rocks with that. You get half a rock on, on, on shore. But anybody with, with these panels, these solar panels on their roof, they get next to nothing for the electricity. I, I do understand a lot of electricity comes from France and, it, and it's nuclear electricity and they've put their prices up because they don't like how a women's football team beating them i think i think the, i think that's what's going, what's going to end up with france against england isn't it but i mean i don't know whether anybody saw last night's football match but uh, i'm still sobering up from that but i do feel we ought to sort of look into the way of i'm in some sort of a con conference or some way that we can scrutinize and ask questions to certain people i think that if we do if we fail on this which we probably will that we ought to still look into that bit of having some sort of a conference that that's my input and that's it thank you very much indeed councillor Barham. i always nice to have a reference to football councillor councillor harold thank you mr chairman um, just really to say that I will be supporting the amendment and for me the fundamental issue is around, um, as Councillor Owen started this off with, they're a little bit late to the party. We have had lots of meetings, there are lots of things going on and Councillor Handley has given us these, uh, you know, a breakdown of the amount of money that has already been spent and that's looking at 23 million and the additional 4.4 million that Cabinet made the decision we wanted to um, re retain that to be able to make sure that that went to the right place I think is is the right thing to do we actually don't know what some of the landscape looks like because things are changing so much we talk about the benefits but actually from what I'm seeing on the street Mr Chairman the issues are with our working families the way they were too, our we used to be called latchkey kids back in the day both parents um, went out and had a job and their birth worked. And that's where we're seeing. And Mr. Chairman, do you know the reason we're seeing it? Because we're out there and we do live in the real world. And apologies if we do get a little bit angsty when we're given things like, you know, you're out of touch, you're not grassroots. How dare you, anyone ever say that? How dare they? It's insulting to say that. We all participate really well in our communities. Many of us are go on governing bodies. We're at parish council meetings. We're speaking to our residents and hearing what the issues are. And it's for that and that reason only that I'm going to be supporting the amendment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harold. Councillor Walker. Thank you, Chair. Um, the fantastic work by the voluntary sector in the pandemic is now the stuff of legend. And I don't think the original motion seeks to diminish that in any way. But the critical difference between the original and the amendment is that the amendment will tell the community of the fantastic work that is going on behind the scenes. The original motion, however, 
seeks to listen. And that's why I feel that the original motion understands the plight. We are also there to listen, not just to tell them. So I will be supporting the original motion as posted. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Councillor Gill. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, listening to, to both arguments here, um, whichever uh, original or the amendment you're going to go with, uh, they both involve getting the Chief Exec to write to Secretary of State about demanding a reduction in VAT, 17.5%. Um, I think I'd like to put forward an amendment to that, that if there are any reductions in VAT, they are made to be passed on by the suppliers concerned which we didn't see with the fuel uh, reduction, the 5% VAT in, in uh, fuel reduction, or five pence, I beg your pardon, fuel reduction wasn't passed on by the garages or the fuel suppliers. So I think that's a smaller detail and that's some grassroots information I've picked up from residents when that happened. So I, it's something I would like to see in there. Um, I mean, as for VAT, I mean, on electric and gas, should that be redu that's a re reduced VAT anyway? Should that be taken off for a short period of time as well? Something else to add. Thank you. As we can only have one amendment on the table at any one time, we'll be moving on with this, and then if necessary, going back to yours. Thank you, Councillor Gill. Uh, Councillor Healy. To take Councillor Gill's point, I think if there is an immediate reduction in the standard rate of VAT, it will come down from 20% to 17.5%, and there'll be no question about that. It will be imposed um, across the piece, as it was when VAT was last reduced. I think for me, that whatever we end up with, um, realistically, I'm very pleased that we're going to have this motion, whether it's the original motion or, or the amended motion. I'm, I, I, I fully agree with Councillor Walker. That I, think, I think the amendments, uh, you know, the the inclusion of the summit demonstrates that one is listening but for me that's quite not quite as important as what comes before it and I'm delighted that you've accepted this mo this this motion from us because first of all you've accepted a cost of living emergency which you were not you didn't want to do last time and I'm pleased that you are doing this time um, and I think the standard rate reduction of VAT you know that's monumental if that happened it would be it would put six hundred pounds a year back into the into the pockets of ordinary working families. That would boost the economy. That would help enormously. It would be something genuinely positive. Um, so you know, whatever motion we end up with, uh, we've got that, uh, and I think we can celebrate that. And I think we should celebrate it and move on from it. Frankly, I, I mean, of, of course, you know, it's as written. I think the summit. It's a good idea, but it's not as important as the reduction in VAT. And if we get that in this motion in the end, then I think that's a win for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Haley. Councillor Temple. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's really just a bit of advice. Um, do those of us who are in the chamber who are trustees and or volunteers of food banks need to declare um, an interest um, as both a trustee and a volunteer of Love Driffield, Driffield and Wolds Food Bank? Um, perhaps I ought to just um, make that known to everyone. Um, and whilst uh, um, we are, obviously it's not a, a pecuniary interest, um, I, I, I am grateful for the money that this council has passed through, both in um, support through COVID and through the Love Your High Street Fund. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Temple. Uh, Councillor Owen has a right of reply before Councillor Nolan closes the debate. Uh, Councillor Nolan. Sorry, Councillor Owen. Yeah. Did we get a decision on the, you know, whether you need to declare an, an interest or not before? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so if members feel it is appropriate to declare that interest, then that interest should be declared. It's down to well, the man. I assume it's non pecuniary, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. Can you press the buttons to declare an interest zone? Is that what you're saying? No? Yeah. So, if you wish to declare an interest at this moment, press the button. Thank you. Right. 
And we've had a forest of hands waving at me. I'm not used to that. And a lot of people have been pressing buttons down there. Is that purely to declare an interest or just because you felt like pressing a button? No further interest to be declared. It is normal for many who are declaring an interest to state what the interest is in question. No, which one do you press? So do you want to go through all that? Work through the list. Okay. Uh, we'll start with the vice chairman. Uh, I received money from the council and from the government for my business. So that would be an interest, I think. Councillor Boynton. Um, um, I volunteer for Beverly Freemasonry Food Bank. Councillor Handley. Um, I volunteer at the Two Rivers Community Food Bank in Goole. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hadley. Councillor Wilkinson. Mm. I'm volunteer for um, Howden Helpers and, um, uh, and also for Community Kitchen. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Holmes. A uh, participant in Withensea Big Local, which although they haven't received financial um, assistance from this council, as far as I'm aware, officers have given their time, as indicated, to work with the um, money helper drop-in sessions. May I remind councillors that it is customary to rise when you're addressing the chair. Councillor Kotish. Thank you, Chairman. Similarly to Councillor Handley, I've volunteered for Two Rivers uh, Community Food Bank in Gull as set up by Councillor Handley. Thank you. Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chair. I do volunteer when I can at the Driffield Food Bank and love Driffield, uh, the, the one that's uh, trusted by uh, Councillor Temple. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Corliss. Chairman, I'm trustee of a children's charity that has had quite a lot of receipts of support not monetary in terms of shoes clothing food etc and i also give assistance with the operation of a food bank thank you councillor corliss uh councillor johnson uh, thank you um i uh help raise funds and uh help out at the open doors project in hull thank you councillor Patton. Help set up Hesel and Anderby Food Bank, and I collect every day and have done from the first day when it's a lockdown and still collecting seven days a week. Well, you're standing up, Councillor Pardon. Councillor Temple. Thank you. I'm a volunteer and a trustee of Love Driffield, uh, Driffield and Wales Food Bank, and have been since 2017. Thank you, Councillor Temple. Councillor Harold. We are at two separate um, organisations that distribute food ongoing and also, as per my declaration has been on their years, volunteer at a local advice centre, all local and in my ward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harold. Councillor McMaster. Thank you, Chair. My company has donated several pallet loads of products to various uh, food banks for distribution. Thank you. Councillor Nolan, your, your thing's up there, but is this a declaration of interest or is this for later? I'm not currently involved. Okay, thank you, Councillor Nolan. So after all that, where were we? Ah, yes, Councillor Owen, you have the right to reply before Councillor Nolan closes the debate. You may cast your mind back, it was some time ago, but... I was going to say, I think it's an age thing, you know, I might be going down with something, but uh, I can just about remember where we were before that, so... 
Seriously, though, th this is about what we're already doing. And I think it's come across very clearly, particularly from Council on Homes, with what's going on in Withensea, that many of us are involved in things that are going on behind the scenes at a local level. Some of the stuff we didn't touch on, or Councillor Handley didn't, with the list of things that have been happening, we haven't talked about our welfare visiting teams, our benefit entitlement checkers, our budgeting tools, where you can input your income and spending and get advice as to how to manage it better. We have all our range of council tax support and discretionary reductions. We have emergency assistance schemes, warm house, warm home discount schemes, insulation, your switch, Watershore, all the work around free school meals, the holiday activity fund, all stuff that goes on behind the scenes all the time to, to help people. I picked up on the comment earlier about the stigma of these sort of things. And that's something we really have to get across to the public. And that will be done over the next few months on a communication strategy around this very topic. And one of those messages is for many people who have never gone to look for benefits before in their lives must be told there's no stigma attached to that. This is how you do it. And it's that communication to people as to what's available, how they can access it, and don't be worried trying to do it. We have a financial inclusion strategy that will be due in a couple of months' time that takes in a lot of this. I mean, that wasn't as a result of any cost of living crisis. We've always had one which has been refreshed and brought up to date. I think this has accelerated and extended some of the work we'll be doing. So I go back to my original point. I don't think we need summits and headlines. We just to meet, need to make people aware what is out there for them, what support we have, and how they can access it. And that's our role. So I hope people will support the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Uh, Councillor Nolan. To, to uh, reply, I mean, nobody is criticising what the council is doing. It's doing what it can within the limited means it's got. And, and we all support that. It's not the Conservative group doing it, it's the whole council agreeing it. What we're talking about, though, is a summit to share best practice and to understand better what's going on in our local community. The problem with the amendment is it just it says we're going to tell them how, how marvellous the council is. Well, well, sadly, the council is only going to be a small part of the solution here. It does need um, government to, to get involved. It needs far more. No one's mentioned, for example, the, the cut. Uh, nobody's mentioned the... Um, the increase in uh, one half percent in national insurance that is hitting a lot of people. The fuel uh, pr uh, prices shooting up is obviously hitting a lot of people. A summit, I think, would lead to a better understanding and perhaps a better targeting of help rather than telling people what's available. Let's talk to them and listen to them. I will finish by saying one thing, and I hope I'm not interrupting a conversation over there because this is quite an important issue, Chair. Our surveys are showing that the cost of living is one of the biggest issues with, amongst residents. It's, it's now hitting at the level of concern about the NHS, doctors and dentistry services. So it's clearly a big issue. The council's doing what it can. That's great. But we do need better understanding. And let's have a local summit where we can actually share and learn and share best practice. And I think that's all we're trying to do here. And it's a shame that the Conservative group won't accept that. Um, we're happy with the, the bits they put in about what the council's doing. We're not criticising the council, but we do think there should be a summit. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Dunham. I'll now take the vote on the amendment first. All those in favour, please show. Those against? Abstentions? Looks very much to me as if the amendment is carried in which case it becomes a substantive motion upon which we vote again. And at that point, I shall invite Councillor Gill if he needs to put another event, his amendment in. Not at the moment, just wait, hold your horses, but you will need to have a second. So we're going to the substantive motion, which is the amendment as we've just voted. All those in favour of the substantive motion, please show. Those against? Abstentions? Right, that's the original, the, now the original motion. It has been changed by the substantive motion. And now we move on to Councillor Gill. Did you have a seconder for your 
amendment and would you care to restate that amendment for us to understand it? Uh, yeah, th uh, thank you Chair. Yes, this was, um, if we are writing to government, to lobby government to reduce VAT to 17.5%, uh, reducing it 17.5% on uh, petrol and diesel is a very small amount of money because um, fuel duty takes up a, a good amount of that, so there's still an income for the government. So with that being a, such a short reduction, um, I feel that there should be some way of making sure that is passed on to consumers and not kept by garages, for example. And also, uh, there's no mention of actually uh, reducing the amount of VAT specifically on gas and electricity or not having VAT at all. So it was adding some words, if someone can help me <laughs> get that across to see if that could be part of the amendment. Thank you, Councillor Gill. Yes. Motion. Is this the right time to take in a, a second amendment? I'm um, advised that it's occurred. Hmm. Well, I think it, it is a question of uh, points and AKS, because we have not uh, a second of the Councillor Gill as yet. So in that case, your amendment falls and the original motion stands. So we'll move on. Thank you very much. Right, we'll move on to Councillor Weeks, who has 10 minutes. Um, right. Chairman, I'd like to move the motion as written. Um, I, I thought a lot about what the best way would be to approach introducing this motion. And, and I believe that the best way to do that would be to encourage you to imagine that you're a resident of Willoughby, which I know, aren't you lucky? Um, I want you to think back to the heat wave we had last week. I want you to think back um, to Tuesday, to last Tuesday, it's 38 degrees. You finished work, spent the day in a sweltering office, probably a little bit like this one. And uh, you come back to your house, the house that you've spent a lot of money on. The house that you've put time and effort into creating the perfect garden with beautiful flowers, maybe a small water feature, an environment that you created to enjoy. Mother Nature's done her part and has provided you with the perfect opportunity to spend some time outside. But you can't because it stinks. And after the disappointment of not being able to sit in your garden, um, you're, you've been sweltering and sitting inside your house, you decide to go to bed. And now it's, now it might, now it might, now imagine it's 3 a.m. It's 27 degrees outside, even in the middle of the night. It's even warmer inside your bedroom. It's stuffy. You're feeling like you're suffocating on hot air. The fan you've got in your room is just blowing the state, the same stale air around and you want to open your window to let in some fresh air, but you can't because it stinks. And I don't mean that it smells, I mean that it stinks. It absolutely stinks. The smell is enough to force you to keep your windows closed, to not enjoy your garden. It makes you feel physically sick. Members, this isn't fiction. This isn't a horror movie, although it, it could be. For the residents of Willoughby and Cottingham and all across the East Riding, this is a reality. Um, for residents in Willoughby and Cottingham specifically, the smell is thought to be coming from the waste treatment site where to our brown bin waste is sent. And let's think about that for a moment. A contract that we have as a council is causing such misery to council tax paying residents. And it isn't just a foul smell, and it isn't just this one site. The effects of waste treatment sites all over the East Riding, um, the effects that they have on local residents are numerous. It could be noise, it could be dust, it could be vibrations. Different sites present differing and unique problems for residents. Now, this council wins awards year after year for how we handle residents' waste, which, of course, should be commended. But at what cost? Sites we're contracting with, whether directly or indirectly through third parties, are causing misery for some of our residents, the residents that we're here to serve, and that needs to change. And this motion seeks to do that. Let's explore in more detail what, what this motion is seeking to achieve. Number one, 
It's seeking to put the potential impact a site will have on a local community ahead of value for money and convenience when we are commissioning waste treatment services. Now, clearly, ensuring that we pay, that we pay a fair price and get a good service is a critical part of the procurement process. But we need to do more to ensure that the way that we deal with our waste isn't impacting re the, the residents and that that impact or potential impact is considered first and foremost when procuring waste treatment services. And it was interesting to see on the council's commissioning and procurement strategy document that it suggests commissioning and procurement decisions should support local communities. At no point though, in that document, does it say anything about ensuring local communities are not adversely affected by council procurement decisions? It makes the point that we should be demonstrating to residents and other stakeholders that the council is achieving good value for money for residents. But if you speak to the local communities, if you speak to residents in Cottingham and in Willoughby, I'm pretty sure they couldn't care less. Because for residents um, who can't open their windows or being kept out of their garden, the, the council's bottom line really isn't their concern. Two, it's seeking to discount sites that have a proven track record of causing disruption to the local community. If we know that a site is causing problems, whether it be smell, noise, dust or whatever, we should not be renewing that contract, extending the misery for local communities. It's inconceivable that the council could even consider doing business with sites that are causing and are known to cause such misery to council taxpayers. Three, to ensure that the council carries out a robust series of monitoring to assess how sites um, who have contracts with the council are operating and the impact that those sites are having. Now we know that the Environment Agency are responsible for the licensing and monitoring of many of our waste treatment sites and we would encourage them to continue to do so. However, we need to take some of the responsibility for ourselves. We can't just rely on the environment agency. We should be keeping a close eye on the sites that we have contracts with to ensure that taxpayers' money is not being spent with sites that have an adverse impact on those residents' lives. And finally, four, ensuring that contractual agreements between the council and waste sites contain clauses that allow the council to end the contract early where it is found that that site is having an, an adverse impact on local residents. To me, that just seems basic. So simply members, this is about protecting our residents who work hard, who pay their council tax and deserve a bit of understanding from their council. Now I recognize, I'm not naive, that in some cases this won't stop the smell. The council won't be the only customers or the noise, or the dust, or the vibrations, but at least we will have peace of mind that we as a council are doing everything that we can to limit the impact. And I hope that you'll support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Weeks. To second, we have Councillor Green. Thank you, Chairman. I'm very pleased to second this motion. Um, Councillor Weeks has basically covered most of the things I was going to say, but I still read what I'm going to say. For many years, residents in part of the East Riding have had to put up with disgusting odours from recycling plants. We all appreciate and we understand the need to recycle waste. These obnoxious odours have a dreadful impact on their lives. From not being able to use their gardens to having to sleep with their windows closed overnight, you can only imagine how that must have felt during the recent hot weather. Some residents are physically sick from the awful smells. I ask the council to listen to the taxpayers of East Riding to ensure that these sites are monitored on a regular basis. The Environment Agency monitors these sites as well as the council. I understand on occasion sites are visit visited up to five times a day. If that volume of visits is required, surely there must be a problem. Why is this not being addressed? To be told it's not bad enough is not good enough. Service providers to the East Riding of Yorkshire Council should provide a high standard and not cause a nuisance to public health through failure to ensure best practice is being employed. The East Riding of Yorkshire should not accept any, any less than best available practice and service providers that fail to comply should be held responsible. 
I understand that if any site is causing an odour nuisance under the Environment Protection Act 1990, we can, can issue an abatement notice. This needs addressing urgently as the impact on mental health and physical health is very concerning. I urge the council in future to assess the locations of these sites to avoid the impact some residents are enduring currently. Any application for any licenses must be scrutinized to ensure our residents are not affected. The location of these sites has to be considered so not to impact on our communities. There must be robust monitoring of the sites. Any previous business that has a proven track record of causing disruption should not be granted a license. I ask that the council takes immediate action in support of our residents in the East Riding regarding any of the sites that are affecting their quality of life. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Green. Councillor Abraham. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I'm more than happy to support this motion as presented by Councillor Weeks, and I have every sympathy for the residents of Willoughby and the surrounding area. To live with it on a, on a regular basis and not be able to enjoy your homes and gardens is dreadful. We all generate waste. We know it has to be treated somewhere, but we don't want to be reminded of it on a sometimes daily basis. And we don't want to fear for our health and that of our children and vulnerable adults. Residents in my ward and the villages of Melton and North Derby in particular know all about the impact that living near a waste treatment site can have. Indeed, we live next to the largest active waste facility in Yorkshire. We know all about the odours, the dust, the litter, the noise, the vibration, and residents frequently raise concerns about emissions to the atmosphere and the quality of the air that they breathe. And we experienced regular fires at the site, the most recent being just two weeks ago, when many tons of commercial waste were alight. South Hunsley's is a site that takes East Riding Council's green bin waste, but the East Riding contract is not with the company in my ward. It is a different company who then subcontracts the waste handling and processing to the Melton site. So a word of caution on the motion before us, that as a council, we should look closer than the immediate contractual arrangements and look instead at the handling of East Riding waste right the way down the processing chain to see what impact it has, not only on our own residents, but possibly on residents of other authorities. To send our waste off and not have due regard to what happens at later stages is not ethical and there should be full disclosure and assessment of sites to be used before a contract is granted to any umbrella organisation. In addition to the human impact, the environmental implications of our waste handling all down the processing chain should form part of the forthcoming climate change strategy. Otherwise that will be a tick box exercise and not achieve its full potential. Maybe this is a topic that could be considered by the Environment and Regeneration Subcommittee. So I'm supporting the motion and wish the Stop the Stink campaign every success. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abraham. Councillor Jump. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I, I fully endorse Councillor Week's motion. There is a big problem. My, my one fear is that if we pull out our contracts, then there's going to be a gap which will be filled by another company over which we will have a little control. So I would just add, I don't want to repeat a lot of what's been said, but I sincerely hope that our public protection staff work even more closely with the Environment Agency so that we can manage the problems at the moment and hopefully erode them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jump. Councillor Meredith. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd like to firstly start by thanking Councillor Weeks and Councillor Green for bringing this before us today. I'm happy to support the motion and hope that all of the councillors will see the merit as well as the scope of what is proposed, especially alongside Councillor Abraham's points, um, and that the entire process and chain need careful examination and proper accountability throughout. Now, across the East Riding, there are many businesses and processes that provide functions which are needed, activities which ensure services can function and the infrastructure can be maintained. These are not without consequence or impact, and it is often beyond the current remit of the council to properly manage a situation should, um, should one ever arise. Now, this is not an acceptable situation to find ourselves in. 
Reliance upon outside bodies to ensure that the amenity of our residents is protected and maintained means that we are unable to work on behalf of the residents that we are here to represent. In short, we are unable to fulfill our role or our purpose. Each point of this motion <laughs> takes a step towards empowering this authority to act on behalf of residents. The purpose here is not to create a cudgel, but a scalpel. I believe that there is a purpose behind each of the four points listed and will now illustrate their worth. By ensuring that amenity is at the heart of procure, the, the procurement process, we show that our values and our actions align, that we truly are a council where everyone matters. Showing preference to operators, which minimise their impact, incentivizes the best practices and creates a race to the top, not the bottom. Businesses with the best practices are what we want to see in our county, and this must be given weight in the procurement process. Plus, if we harken back to earlier, it's an excellent place for an apprenticeship. Now, monitoring and data collection are a vital aspect of ensuring the above criteria are being met. They are also vital in expediating any investigation should one ever be necessary to be undertaken. This council has a responsibility to residents to make sure that amenity is protected. Without monitoring, there can be no measurement of impact or progress. Accountability is the final aspect of what is before us today, and this is essential if a situation arises which requires this authority to act. Without empowering our officers, all else is meaningless, and a toothless tiger with a growl but no bite will soon be discovered to be ineffectual. So what is before us today is a motion which allows the council to work on behalf of residents, to support a 32-year-old piece of legislation, and to enable the council to play a meaningful role in protecting the immunity of those we are here to serve. To work with businesses and organisations in the knowledge that this council has the tools and the capacity to motivate, so that best practice is not just an ambition, but the norm. As technologies change and demands evolve, we must be able to adapt to meet need. This motion enables this authority to be exactly that, an authority. So please support the motion and illustrate to all our residents that this council truly believes everyone matters. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Meredith. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Chair. I fully support the motion and all the points in it. I think it's also very important that we as councillors and as a council as a whole do all we can to ensure that our own planning enforcement team, public protection team and the environment agency are as tough as they can be with organisations like this in the aim of protecting residents. And I know myself and the portfolio holder, Council Holmes, have been talking about this recently, how we can help our planning enforcement team do that as much as we can in terms of resources and stuff. And we are planning, Council Holmes is organising a member development session to give members them all the equipment of knowledge they need to ensure that our planning officers, planning enforcement officers are doing their job to the best of their ability for residents. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Padden. On and also I'd like to thank Councillor Jump for what she said, which I think are very important allies to change in documentation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Padden. Councillor Corliss. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I fully support the motion and I wholeheartedly agree with everything that Councillor Abraham said regarding the facility at Melton. I think I particularly support the inclusion of point three, which says that in <coughs> when we're monitoring, the key word is robust. Monitoring must be robust. I have asked questions about dust. I'm thinking of dust here in particular. And it is extremely difficult, but it's, it's perfectly possible to test dust. And I have been met with responses that say, well, well we don't have the capacity, we don't have the abilities to do that. We don't have what we need to do that. And robust monitoring should be exactly what it says. It should be robust. It should involve spending what's needed and getting the expertise that's needed to be able to carry out such tests. It shouldn't just be saying, well, we've monitored, but we can't actually do anything because we don't have capacity. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Corliss. Councillor Medini. Thank you, Chairman. We've, we've so many residents in my area affected by this, it'd go, you know, it'd go amiss without me actually having to say anything. So I'm glad Council Weeks, Council Green, have put this motion forward. I've had that many complaints, I've had to set up a separate email address. So in the past few months, I've had hundreds of complaints, and that's just from the one site near us. So, you know, all these four points are a good start, you know, moving it forward. And I, I like Councillor Abraham's 
idea of putting it forward for the work program. So in our workshop program setting, I'll be suggesting that that'll be put forward. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Medini. Councillor Beeks, would you care to close the debate? Yes, um, only to say thank you for all the positive comments. We've heard some really passionate speeches by um, members for Cottingham, South Hunsley, and uh, it's clear that this is a problem that stems well beyond um, my ward and potentially across the entire East Riding. This is about making sure that we're putting residents first, that we understand the impact that um, residents can face as a result of having their waste uh, dealt with. Uh, Councillor Abraham makes a very valid point. You know, we all produce waste. We're all partially responsible. Um, but our, our job here now is to make sure that the work that, uh, that, that goes into um, uh, dealing with our waste and processing our waste, we can continue to win awards without having to uh, impact on um, the residents' lives. So thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you very much, Councillor Weeks. I will now take the vote. All those in favour, please show. Those against? Abstentions? Thank you. That is carried. And thank you very much, Councillor Weeks. Uh, just before we move on, uh, just to uh, put Councillor Temple's mind at rest regarding her point of order, uh, it is a matter of documentation that uh, if the amendment is carried, that then becomes a substantive motion to which other amendments can be put. So we were okay in that. Thank you. And now move on to a uh, notion of motion. Notice of motion. This is a time lag kicking in now. By uh, seven o'clock, I've lost my voice entirely. Uh, to move, Councillor Padden. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think I've got a second sub, Councillor Paulus, because uh, Councillor Nolan's not in the chamber. Thank you. Uh, as a member of the Royal British Legion, the Armed Forces Covenant that came out, and I'd like to read that prior to going through what we are saying here. An enduring covenant between the people of the United Kingdom, the Manchester's government, and all those who served or have served in the armed forces of the Crown and their families. The first duty of government in the defence of the realm, our armed forces fulfil that responsibility on behalf of the government, sacrifice some civilian freedoms, facing danger and sometimes suffering serious injury or death as a result of their duty. Family also play a vital role in supporting the operational effectiveness of our armed forces. In return, the whole nation has a moral obligation to the members of the Naval Service, the Army and the Royal Air Force together with their families. They deserve our respect and support and fair treatment. Those who serve in the armed forces, whether regular or reserve, those who have served in the past and their families should face no disadvantage compared to other civilians and citizens in the provision of public and commercial services. Special consideration is appropriate in some cases, especially those who have given most, such as injury and the bereaved. The obligation involves the whole of society, it includes voluntary and charitable bodies, private organisations and actions of individuals in support of the armed forces, recognise those who perform military duties, unite us in the country and demonstrate the value of their contribution. This has no greater expression than a holder in the comment. So my motion is about the service personnel. So I had an email from a serving member who's now discharged because of the problems. And I wasn't aware of these because I served, but I didn't have these problems. And there are a lot of things that are to be expected when you have a medical discharge. We are given a medical compensation pension, depending on the injuries, how it affects us. It can only be 30% pension, but the effects of your injuries could just be as much as those who have been awarded 90%. We are not provided with any medical care out of the NHS limits, i.e. prostatus, new medication, or even transport to see specialists if that would help us in our individual cases. The medical pension is supposed to be a living wage amount, but it falls very short of that, and a great deal of veterans struggle on the money they are paid. The medicine pension, medical pension does not assist in any extra care or requests, and are put forward in assisting veterans in a normal life, paying free. It can be very lonely and stressful life, even just completing daily tasks or keeping home as life as normal as possible. It is very difficult to get professional help 
at times. Oh, for our ongoing medical needs and advice. They were the means of veterans suffer in their homes without the proper care due to the aid them day to day and on a daily basis. They are in need of nurses or catering visits in their homes. These are their own costs and not provided free despite their need for them. The medical pension should not be used or classed as an income where there has been an injury that has caused our service to end. Upon medical discharge, you lose your job, your home, the way of life, identification as you've known it. It's a very traumatic experience and many do alone with no suffer support. It doesn't, however, affect family and friends for those who are close to the per serving person. To be penalised due to injuries or disabilities caused by your service is not now as medically payment is classed. When you are awarded, you should not be taken into consideration at any point as an income. The Armed Forces Covenant should now have regulations brought in to ensure that this does not happen. We are not protected at all in the way after a medical discharge, and even things such as life insurance, gain of a mortgage, can be out of our reach once we leave the services due to our injuries, not allowing coverage or being classed as a high risk or low income. So that's the basics of the people that have come to me. So, and the Royal British Legion. So basically what I've said here and what I would like to finish off with is that military compensation can be awarded through the war pension schemes, armed forces compensation schemes, or through a veterans occupation, occupational armed forces pension schemes, known as service invalidity pensions, or service attribution pensions. Compensation awards under these schemes may also include supplementary payments. The compensation mm -hmm. often interact with benefits issued through local authorities and may impact a veteran's entitlement to benefits. While some benefits such as universal credit rightly dis disregarded military compensation as income, others that they did dis disregard it and others administrators are subject to the discretion of the local authorities do not always do so meaning that some veterans must give up the compensation to access essential financial support and that is one of the reasons why i'm not very happy with the uh, amendment comes in and says that military the discretion of local authorities so that's the most i reserve the right to speak chair thank you Councillor Patton. Uh, seconded by Councillor Corliss. I'll second that motion. Thank you, Chair. And there's nothing up there. So we move on to an amendment which has been submitted by Councillor Elvich. Councillor Elvich. Size and the original motion. Everything okay? It's uh, disappointing that some people have seen fit to leave to watch neighbours, but I think this is an important issue. I thank Councillor Padden for raising it. I think it's important that the amendment is the one that we vote for. We push through, we get it sorted, we take some immediate action and action as soon as we can when we've reviewed policies and then action if we need to, to lobby government further for an action for our armed forces. And when I say armed forces, I mean the entire community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Elvich. Second, Councillor Lee. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think my colleague was being quite uh, magnanimous to the... Uh, uh, oh, he's come back. I do apologise. In fact, I won't make a comment in that case. Um, yeah, no, I'm very happy to second this motion. It's very important that we... Uh, or second the amendment. It's very important that we are fair to armed services, but it's also very important that we uh, use the local authorities' discretion uh, and keep this local rather than uh, the, the original um, proposal, the original motion. So I'm very happy to uh, second the amendment. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I'm not sure if we need uh, the seconder for the original motion to speak first, if I'm quite happy to uh, let that happen if necessary. Uh, I believe Councillor Corliss did second. Oh, did someone already second? I do apologise. Um, Yes, I, first of all, let me um, declare, uh, as I wasn't going to speak originally on this motion, that I am in receipt of a military pension and um, I'm, I also was in receipt of an armed forces um, compensation payment uh, for injuries. 
Um, this is a really difficult one. I, I am so pleased that Councillor Padden has brought this up and that Councillor Elvidge has done his normal trick, which is to um, make something rather large into something really compact. Um, uh, and uh, it is difficult. Uh, the Armed Forces uh, Compensation Scheme um, for illness and injury caused uh, during service or death for that matter, um, came in after April 2005. So before that, we had such schemes as the war pension scheme and wounds pensions, et cetera. And, and that caused um, a, a little bit of an issue because when they try to draft this new legislation, we can sh see how difficult it is to, uh, to envisage every single uh, action and um, unexpected consequences of realizing that this legislation causes a problem with tax and with receipt of other benefits. Um, what you can receive is a tax-free um, index-linked payment, whether it be a lump sum or, um, or a monthly payment on a regular basis, between £1,236 as a minimum and £650,000 as a maximum, usually for death, I would say, in that case. And that's set by legislation by Parliament, and we have nothing to do with that. And these are for more serious injuries. I stress that it's tax-free and completely um, index-linked. The problem with it is, as Councillor Padden has brought up, is that that can be taken into consideration as your income, which is sad uh, and isn't in the spirit of the legislation it was brought up. And we as a council do need to look at the spirit of this. Um, that our armed forces, and for that matter, many other forces that are involved, such as police, etc., cetera, um, uh, that are injured during the service of our communities and of our country, uh, should not be penalised um, in this way. And, and I am so pleased that both Councillor Padden and Councillor Elvidge have, has brought, have brought this up. It is very difficult, and I, you may have noticed I did clarify with Councillor Aitken that the, the income received by, by Foster yes, uh, 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 is not taken into account, yet people who risk their lives every day, um, it does seem to be at the moment taken into account. So I have no hesitation whatsoever in supporting um, this, this motion, specifically the, the, the amendment, which uh, I think, um, Councillor Padden, you would agree, just, just condenses it down. Um, and we should be happy with that and makes it much easier for us to deal with. Uh, and I will be delighted to vote on behalf of that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Councillor Healy. Would you care to press the microphone button, Councillor? Sorry. Sorry, Chair. I, would, I think it's slightly regrettable an amendment's been made. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the amendment at, at all. I mean, I, at first I was thinking, um, is this in addition to the motion? Because if it is, that's absolutely fine. Um, and then I've just realised, actually, no, we want to scrap the full motion and replace it with this. Um, and I guess that's what you're probably going to do. But it still is a little bit regrettable because whilst it is wordy, I think it goes into some detail about what Councillor Padden is trying to get to um, in terms of the compensation and how it's paid and that the authority should assess applications for benefits over which they exercise discretion. Also, the amendment completely wipes out the Royal British Legion. It completely means that all reference to our support for the Royal British Legion is removed. I'm very surprised that Councillor Elvidge wants to remove a reference to support for the Royal British Legion because I know it's something that he's very passionate about. Um, so I think we're all saying the same thing. At the end of the day, this is, this is, this is words. I mean, I, I think what Councillor Elvidge has said is absolutely commendable. Um, I think what Councillor Padden has said is absolutely commendable. It goes into more detail and talks about the Royal British Legion. Can I suggest that we have them both? As, as this and, and that, that, that Councillor Elvig's amendment is part of the motion and that, I mean, at the end of the day, it's not as long as the motion that we've just agreed on the cost of living increase. Um, I'll rest my case. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Healy. I'm not quite sure that I was happy with the bills. That might lead to a few difficulties, a further debate of several hours. Uh, Councillor Elvis, you have the right of reply before Councillor Padden closes the debate. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, if I could make myself a little bit more clearer, the reason for this is course so concise is I think it leaves us options then to look at other things. I think it's too restrictive to tell us that we're looking through the British Legion information when we need to look at all options. And I can assure you we will explore every single option that we can to do everything we can to every single member of the Armed Forces community. Thank you, Councillor Elvich. And Councillor Padden, would you care to close the debate? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Elvich. Yes, this did come to me direct from Royal British Legion. I was amazed when I got it. And I did some making inquiries, and I thank everybody for the support. And thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Yes, I will support the fire brigade, police, all emergency services that act on our behalf to become injured. So it's just an RBL situation. So I'd like to close the meeting and thank you for your support. Thank you. Uh, I, I think you. Uh, I think you'll find, Councillor Pallon, the only one around here is going to close any meetings is me. Uh, before I take the vote, however, and it's very unusual, I, I, I would never dream of speaking from the chair on matters like this, but what I would say is how much I appreciate the way in which you're working together on this and achieving some sort of benefit one way or the other. So I'm going to go to the vote. All those in favour of the amendment, please show. Those against? Abstentions? Thank you. The amendment is carried and now becomes a substantive vote. All those in favour? Those against? Abstentions? Thank you, that is carried. And if I may say, that was a really enjoyable debate. Thank you. Right, man, moving on very swiftly to item 13. Uh, proportionality and allocation of places on committees to move that the allocation of seats on the ordinary committees of the council as set out in paragraphs 2.5 and 2.7 of this report be approved. I'd like to second that, thank you. It's too long in there. It's always nice to see people on the ball. I will now take the vote. All those in favour? Those against? Any abstentions? Right, thank you. That is carried. Right. I have a bit to read out here, so pay attention. I need to exclude the public and everything else because it's in accordance with Regulation 5 in brackets 4 of the local authority executive arrangements, close brackets, open brackets, meetings of access to information, close brackets, open brackets, England, close brackets, regulations 2012. The council is asked to consider excluding the press and public from the meeting for consideration of the following item on the grounds that it is likely to involve the disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph three of part one of Schedule 12A of the Local Government Act 1972. In making its decision, the Council is asked to confirm that having regard to all the circumstances, it is satisfied that the public interest in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information. Please can I assume that everyone is in favour of the motion. If you wish to vote against it, please confirm now. Councillor Nolan appears to be voting against it. I actually think it should be held in public, but I understand why you're doing what you're doing. I've just put, pressed my button to speak. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Councillor Nolan. I, I've, I've developed a habit of looking for your name up there now. Uh, right, I assume then that 